Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see a little link down there. and You click on it, you'll end up in Zoom. So you'll see another little link, and you can click on that and end up in Mukana. And that's a place where you can ask questions, uh, vote on those questions, talk to people about those questions. Uh, if you think you can answer those questions, uh, then you could just come in early. Um, and join us in Zoom at uh, 6.40 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, it's when we do mic checks, and uh, you need to be here by then to join the panel. Uh, you can come as early as 6 a.m. if you just want to test your system and make sure that you're, uh, you're ready to uh, join this illustrious group. Uh, over a half a millennia of, of uh, experience uh, here to answer uh, questions or do the best we can. Um, uh, the first hour is all general questions. A second hour is... Um, things that we're a little bit more interested in to talk about uh, at that moment. So, um, so we're gonna we we usually pick that subject sometime <laughs> right before mon Monday morning, um, and uh, and and we go through it there. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about the future of studios. Uh, a lot of studios are probably not where they need to be for the next generation of content, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about what could be added or what we should think about if we were building them. Tomorrow, we're gonna talk a little bit more just about, in general, future trends. Uh, we do this every once in a while where we just talk about things that might affect us and looking down the path of, of things that might um, be important if you're a media producer or a virtual event producer. And then on Saturday is the long day. We have, uh, of course, our general Q&A, then we have uh, two hours of talking about education. Uh, and then Nick Justin will join us and talk about Unreal. So we've all got, we sent out in the email a link to the videos to watch uh, to get ready for Unreal this Saturday. And so we'll be doing that from 10 to 1130. A little bit of it is Q&A uh, that you might have. Uh, secondly is some demo from Nick. And then finally, some lab work where we all kind of work on it together. Then we're going to keep on working together uh, where we uh, are actually going to cook corn fritters. So Hosmuk's wife, uh, uh, Demyati is gonna is going to uh, she is uh, going to join us for the corn fritters. Uh, that's one of the reasons we moved it from five o'clock to noon uh, or eleven thirty was so that she could. It wasn't the middle of the night for her. That was just not fair. So so anyway, so she's going to be joining us. Uh, corn fritters are pretty simple. I did put a PDF in the messages from Alex in Discord, so you can download that PDF and. Um, and uh, if you want to get ahead, they shouldn't take very long to make. Uh, so there'll be lots of discussion. We're trying to we're trying this idea of nothing crazy. Just we're just going to have a, a discussion. And we're going to make some make some food. So uh, so that'll be uh, going on at at eleven thirty, uh, starting eleven thirty, ending at one ish. At one, we're going to go into a different kind of cooking, and we're going to build this little raspberry pie again. So a lot of you, it was an incredible uh, Saturday afternoon working with Jonas to tell uh, to build the play out B. And we're going to do it again for those of you who missed it, because now that we know that it's great, you should come back. So, so we're going to all do it together. You can come on with the camera. You can just follow along. We, we go pretty uh, slow. We are going to open Mukana so that you'll be able to ask questions via there as well. So it should be a lot of fun. Anyway, and also, <clears throat> quick note, there is an addition to Mukana uh, that you might like. Uh, so if you go into your, uh, if you go into Mukana and you uh, look at your notes section. Uh, in Mukana, there is now you have a notepad, which you can just put whatever you want in there. Uh, but you also have a questions area. And where what you can do there is uh, you can add questions. So now you can really think about them all day, every day before the show. You can add those questions. It'll it'll act like a question input. But when you hit go, and you can tag it and everything else, when you hit go, it just saves it. So you could add three or four questions in there. They're all going to be the right length, uh, so you don't have to edit them. I think Jan Jan was asking for that shortened uh, the ability to know whether it was going over or not. So you'll have them all there, and then on during the event, you can just hit go, 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 or you can hit go on this one because it's good for that day. So you could save ones for audio, for video. You could you know tag. Well, we might even add more tags to it just so you have access to all those tags. Um, so you could tag it and then you can save it for the right day that you want to ask that question for a second hour or first hour. So, so anyway, so, um, so we, we want to, we, that, this is, Chris has been working on that for a little bit. And so it, it looks like it's working great. We'd love to have you bang on it. So, um, between shows, uh, or even now you can put them in there, put the notes and then pass them forward and let's see how that, how that works and if it works well. All right, uh, Bill, why don't you take it away? Okie doke. Here we go. First question, highest rated today comes from Nick Pavlinek in Southeast Michigan. And Nick asks, what's the secret the panel uses to eliminate screen reflections on glasses while in Zoom calls? Uh, the biggest thing is angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. <laughs> so if I turn up like this, you can see my lights. So the, the key is having, when your lights are lower, and this is a real problem when you have ring lights, 
is that the ring lights are right, that if you put it right around your webcam, which is what they say you should do, you end up with a light that has angle of incidence equals angle of reflection right back to it. And so you tend to pick up those. As you change that angle upward, um, you're going to get to a point where it's hitting here and then bouncing below the camera. So that, I mean, that's the, the biggest trick to, to clearing the glasses is moving your lights up. Um, they shouldn't, at some point, they should get to a point where they, you don't see them. Hopefully not too high. Any other? Okay, uh, go ahead, uh, Bill and then Ken. So I'll say a couple of things. What I've noticed, uh, yes, the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. Some people have just deep set eyes and it's a balance. If you keep raising your light to lose the reflection in your eyes, sometimes you cast eye socket shadows with just the brow ridge of a person's face. So there's always this balance between how high can I go before I make them look like a raccoon and how low can I go before I see it in the glasses? And that's why Alex's tip about raising the stem somehow. I mean, I've really put balls of gaffers tape behind somebody's ears to just kick the glasses up. It helps a lot. Also, remember that you don't necessarily have to go from straight in front of people. You can light from uh, uh, clamshell type lighting, and that helps sometimes too. Go ahead, uh, Ken, and then Stuart, real quick. Also, uh, watch your monitor. Um, if you've got a very light screen on, on here, like if I adjust my monitor up, then right. you can see the reflection there. Dark so mode. Turn down the bright. Yeah, dark mode. Or turn down the brightness of the monitor screen is a is another dark, tip. Dark mode is key. By the way, every time Ken comes on, I'm always like, I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be amazing. Like it's you know, like it's it's, it's like there's always, it's, it's, it's every show, every show. It's just amazing. All right, so it's, it's, that's that's that has become part of the show. Like Ken, you you have to come every day now because we have to see something every day. All right, uh, Stuart. Something that a lot of people probably don't know about spectacles is, yes, they're called glasses, but they're not all made of glass. There are some made of plastic. Why this becomes important is if you have ones made of glass, you can use Rain-X anti-glare and anti-fog solutions on them to reduce the glare, but you can't use it on the plastic ones. It will eat them. I go ahead, Chris, real, real quick. Yeah, when uh, I mentioned this yesterday, but when we got these, there's a new coating they put on there for nighttime computer use. Uh, don't get that. And half of this would go away. It looks kind of cool, though. It's very techy. Oh, next question. Moving on, Henry Ramos of Yonkers, New York is next. And uh, Henry says, this week I had my first gig canceled because the client is moving to an in-person event. Has anybody else seen this? I haven't seen it yet. Um, but we can expect it to happen. And most of the events that I have are too big to, that, that I'm replacing are too big to put, bring back anytime soon. So, um, so I think that I haven't seen it as much as, as far as an impact goes. Uh, I think that you're definitely going to see that all summer. Uh, I think that I feel like we're going to go through a yo-yo where we go out into trying to doing physical events. And, I, and just like people are finding when they go back to work, people are going to be less excited about them than they were before and then they'll come back to more more and more virtual events and we'll find somewhere in the middle go ahead jan what i'm finding is the opposite the audio engineering show aes was just held in nashville um this week and they did a um they did a streaming um a well so you had the opportunity to be there and they also streamed and they were using remote control to control the avid consoles. Um, so I'm seeing hybrid advance now in our industry. Yeah, I mean, hybrid is going to definitely pick up. I think that again, it, it will probably give way to digital first and online events over time, just because it's really hard to manage that as someone who's tried to manage it. Just the, the digital first events will look will look and sound better for the online audience, which is now getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that makes it really hard to, to justify the, the hybrid. So I think it'll be an interesting process. Go ahead, Chris. You know, Alex, you have in the past said that there are many times where um, uh, people people look at what you're doing, you go, uh, you know, you're kind of crazy, and then they catch up to you, okay? Uh, you've been pushing virtual events for a long time, and then COVID. So I'm wondering, clearly, uh, from a business standpoint, what people are going to try to do, and I, and I agree with you. I, I want to go on record. I agree with you. But what people are going to try and do is make great hybrid events. Yep. And I'm wondering if not for just a pure business standpoint, that it would really behoove us, and I agree with you, to figure out 
how to best do it. I realize there's problems with it. I understand the kitty right. table analogy, and I've used that thanks to you. Uh, but there's going to be a huge I think that push for that. We, I think we had a discussion about that last week. That there is one model that I think that I, I that I would subscribe to as far as a hybrid is what what was done with uh, Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg in um, North Carolina. Uh, there was a all in the round, and I think that you bring everything into the round. You put screen, you, and I, what I would do is put, you know, basically, um, when you, uh, put, when you, if you imagine the person standing here talking or even a, a series of people that are there, and then when you go, when you do this, when you put people all the way around, and then if you put them in basically, um, risers, put, tears. tears, so like risers and curved risers, by the way, just in case you're hard and wondering are really hard to find. You really have to make them. <laughs> Um, from scratch because no one makes them because why would you do that so um we we uh, designed them we, before we knew chris we designed them in wood and we had to figure we, we were literally we, uh when we were getting ready to implement this across a, a, a program we were getting ready to buy a shop bot just to build these so um anyway so you have this what it means is you have you can have about 150 to 200 people all within about 20 feet of the person so that you don't need any amplification uh, but what you can then do is put screens above each one of these. That means that these people can only can see, you know, if, if the person's back to them, they just look up at an iMag. But it also means if you bring anybody virtually in, they can just look up and very comfortably, no one's, no one's crooking their head, you know, into that. Um, and then you can uh, above them or to the sides here, you have camera angles that can all get that person looking, you know, looking from different angles. Um, it means also the speaker can look up in any direction and just see someone coming in from online. Um, I think that as a hybrid event, this is what I would build. You know, for if I if someone said you have to do a hybrid event, we absolutely have to do it. Now I will say it only supports two or three hundred people well before it gets really unwieldy. Um, and really, I don't think that you need more people than that in the room. Now go ahead, Chris, and then yeah, Stuart. And and again, I don't want to beat this horse, but I do want to kick it a little bit. Um, uh, it, the 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 round thing. A good friend of mine. He produces a show for um, a big software company, and he does a similar thing where he has right. these screens that are front and back projected. And uh, this is in Vegas, and it's brilliant because on this screen you could put a two to one piece of video content and a square headshot, iMag, um, center uh, round stage, people all around. Uh, and then if you're low in the audience, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to watch this screen, the back of this screen here. And if you're high in the audience, you're watching this, the outside of the screens. Right. It's really a brilliant screen arrangement. Uh, super costy. Fun to make video content for, though. <laughs> Go ahead, Stuart. I want, like. I can understand the whole anti-hybrid event, but I'm kind of stuck with what I'm doing for the next, well, actually starting last night with a test uh, broadcast. We're doing bands in a pub. Now, the pub is small, and I'm wondering if one of the keys to actually making a hybrid event work is keep the crowd small. So it's intimate. It's like you're going to seeing the band, and it's, but anybody who won't actually physically fit in the volume has to attend online and you do a quality well, and i think it's a huge for them. to your point it's a huge opportunity for uh for small venues to be able to expand their uh viewer base you know so you know if you're so you could be in a small venue that's really great and it only has 10 people in it uh, i i will still say that um i'm not like i'm not if it falls on me i'll do jo those kind of jobs but the thing that that we're pitching is the band looking at people over zoom <laughs> you know, like, you know, like that's that, like what we're pitching is the, the people that you're playing to are, are online. If you look at the David Grohl thing that I posted in Twitter, which is the closest to what I'm trying to get to that I've seen so far, um, is, uh, he's not playing for anybody. Like he, he makes it look a little like that, which I think is a little bit of a bummer. He could have just looked, that was, a, I'm sure a director told him to do that. Um, and it was unfortunate because it would have been great if he just looked into the camera. Um, the whole time, but but outside of that, having this intimate relationship, you can see what happens when you get rid of all the people. You're never going to have that feeling uh, when there's people in the room. Um, so, 
you're right that as a compromise that I think smaller venues are way better than bigger venues with only a handful of people. Um, as long, especially if you say the cameras have priority because that's where most of your viewers are, then you really, you know, get into something that's, that's more interesting. And again, it's going to be old thinking for a while, but you know, th these things all start, you know, in rough versions. When you looked at, there's a, there's a, a video on YouTube somewhere of people showing the state of the art in the late eighties of computer graphics. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> like it's like horrible. So you'd look at that and say that well, no one's ever going to do movies with that. I mean, that's why that's why uh, George Lucas sold Pixar to Steve Jobs because it wasn't going to work or it didn't look like it was going to work anytime soon. It you know, sounds like, like, like that's, you know, <clears throat> so that's it sounds like but to me, that that's hybrid of, events. <laughs> it sounds like for the sort of event we're doing, we really should be implementing a camera that is just for the lead singer that the lead singer performs to to get that connection back to the viewers who are watching online. It is, and it's just that that's the only one you want. And again, it, it's just like, I got to watch a bunch of these. I got to be in a bunch of these uh, occurrences, right? Where Photoshop was like this crazy little thing that, that little interns like me used and the real operators were Cytex and no one's ever gonna, no one, that's never gonna work. <laughs> I was told that over and over and over again. And then I was told that, you know, like I was part of computer gra the computer graphics department at ILM that was, the folks that quit literally got the sale to go to Pixar because they weren't getting, they were being second fiddle to, um, to the model shop, you know, for everything. And they were tired of not being able to get what go where they thought they could go. Right. And then, and so, and then by the time I got there, model shop was a eh, little less than, and, and 10 years later, model shop was gone, you know? And, and so, so when I'm saying that this is that hybrids, are going to die. I'm not saying they're going to die this summer. They're going to die in 10 years. But in 10 years, the hybrid events will be largely gone. Um, uh, Chris and then and then Edwin. Yeah. So when you guys are doing like a child photography or a baby photography or something, you know, everybody sticks a little rubber ducky on top of the, you know, on the camera. Yep. Can you guys uh, for the for the band that you're talking about, can you just get like a, you know, a 40 by 40 picture of just uh, like a crowd of people cut a hole out and stick it over the camera and just have the band look at that well it's called a because teleprompter everybody's been taught <laughs> not to look at the camera i mean we've had no, got no, a couple no. movies where people break the fourth wall and it's like oh my gosh they look oh, at no, the no, camera well that's again that's the um when you look at now interviews i just find interview i can't i can almost not watch interviews now that where they're looking off camera um just because it's not it's just so old um, okay we're gonna have to go really fast uh, edwin and then jan and then we're gonna move on because we're we're deep in questions I oh, can't hear you, Edwin. Would uh would adding a teleprompter like the what would be the DSM adding that yep. that teleprompter feel just so they're looking straight into the camera like I am now like would that help kind of alleviate that sort of absolutely uh, barrier? Absolutely. I mean, we've built tel the largest teleprompter I've built is seventy inches, you know, and so uh, and we and then we built ones with the camera right on the very top of it, right over the person's head, that were full frame. Uh, person, a person that's standing, you could see their whole body, you know, um, in a 90 inch screen, uh, but it wasn't a teleprompter. Cause that was, that would be crazy. Uh, go ahead, Jan. I just threw a link in Makana. Chris Martin from Coldplay bought a theater, a 99 seat theater in Malibu so that he could do some streaming concerts, but he bought it under the pretense that he was going to have his sons and daughters perform there to a 99 seat hall, but he just did a streaming event from there. Yeah. And you'll see a lot more of those. There's a couple of them in that vicinity. Oh, next question. Our friend Jonas Stotel of Reutling in Germany is up next with Alex. Do you have a good example of why text questions are better than an open mic in the room? Note, to convince my supervisor, I am already convinced. Uh, you just have to look at the length of, of question. I mean, anybody who's worked in one of these events has seen what happens when um, – what, what happens when you open a mic and the, the fundamental reason people get up to, I'm, I'm sure that the fundamental reason people get up to ask questions is generally to state things that they want to say. They want to be part of the conversation. They have something that they want to say, or they want to show off, or they want to be noticed. That is why they get up and ask questions. And then they end it with a question that no one cares about, you know? And so, because they, they didn't really think about the question, they thought about it by putting it into text. And most importantly, by adding voting, 
it makes them accountable and they write better questions, you know, and it's much easier for us to have the question drive a conversation, but not be the conversation. And so um, if you look at the velocity of how we go through questions here, you know, we're going to go through 20 or 30 questions in an hour. We could never do that if, if we let people actually talk because they would meander around and, and so on and so forth and not get to the question because they keep the question for the end like hostage, like a hostage. Like, I want to say all my things and I'm not going to give you the question until the very end because otherwise I would just cut you off. Um, like one of the big things we say when, when people are in there is don't ever let people hold the mic. You always want to be able to go like, because you'll see me go like this. And that means just pull the mic away from them. Like we're not, at, we're, not we're, we're, we're done with that person. Now, Bill. Well, I was actually going to make that last point you were making. You will see that in the struggle on like TV shows, where if the host gets the mic anywhere near somebody, they're going to try to grab it. And if you lose the mic, you've lost control of the yeah. show, you've lost everything. Yeah, we we generally also don't have more than two mics in a, in a show if we when we used to do them, um, because then we can just bounce back and forth. The cameras knew where to go. But yeah, you do get that magic moment once out of a hundred that everyone looks back on, well, you get this great interaction. And for that magic moment, you pay in time all the time, every show. It is just like death by a thousand cuts. Um, Jan and then Roscoe, real quick. quick. Quick tip, never give a presenter a mic with a switch on it, an on and off switch. Oh yeah, 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 we don't do that, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, if you're trying to prevent, I'm sorry, if you're trying to provide information, then questions are wonderful. If you're trying to delay, going to delay, I've seen this at stockholder meetings, then go to the open mic concept. It just takes yeah. so long to switch between people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, next question. Adjua McDonald, who's here on the panel often from Vallejo, California, has the next question. And I'd love to get community feedback on having free community workshops and Vallejo project workshops specifically. And she put in a link for that. It's probably more than we can in this in the velocity that we go on a given day is probably something to bring to bring up in a pre show or pre pre show. Um, it would probably for us to dig through that. There's a lot of data there for us to dig in real time. Um, but thanks, Ajua. And uh, I think that it makes sense. Go ahead, Mickey. And the post show runs usually runs way longer. So if you really want to workshop it. Yeah, yeah. Workshop it, bring it into the post show and people will dig right into it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Ajua. Next question. Mark Bridges of Covina, California. Is there a solution that mitigates stationary camera vibration on performance stages? The cameras vibrate in sync to kick drums and bass guitar and make the video unstable. Does the panel have any advice or is the solution just to not do this on questionable stages? And they're looking to live stream in the fall. I go ahead, uh, Stuart and then Roscoe. I will leave it for Alex to talk about sand and concrete. <laughs> uh, the same sort of noise and vibration actually affects us with drag racing. Uh, one of the solutions is, uh, and I've just been looking up the solutions uh, online, I can't find an image yet, but you have a plate that sits under a camera mount that actually has springs that are in tension. So the plate floats on an object. Now, these are often found on Russian cranes uh, on top of cars. Yep, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, so they take out the vibration. Um, but while I was finding that, I saw something else, and I'm going to put a link for eBay in the chat. And trust me, never do this, which is uh, something for safety warning that I'm digressing on. That is a DSLR on a, on a helmet mount with weights at the back of it. Never do it. Trust me on that. <laughs> That's the way to make sure that your camera operator doesn't have any spring left in their neck. I, I, I Bill, very quick. Um, I was just, no, gosh, uh, no, I'm going to pass. Go ahead. Next question. Uh, moving to Tobias Moss of Minneapolis. Tobias asks, uh, looking for a mixed mixer USB interface for two purposes, getting more mics and instruments into a busking loop pedals and uh, PA systems and two a computer for live stream and basic recording currently pre ordered on the Behringer flow eight anyone have a better recommendation or and just are there any disadvantage to using a digital mixer in this circumstance. Price is the only th reason to, to not use a digital mixer, in my opinion, <laughs> at this point. I, would, I wouldn't even want to train people on an analog mixer. I mean, it, it's just, uh, we've had some, I mean, we've done it. I, I've owned hundreds of analog mixers and almost 100 digital mixers. And I would never go, never go back to, a, to an analog mixer. It's just too limited. Go ahead, Jeffrey. There are some pedals that you might want to take a look at if you're going to be doing some busking and uh, doing live streams. They both... They all plug into the computer, turn into sound cards. IK Multimedia makes the iRig Stomp Pro 
which is a pedal board. And then uh, TC Helicon has a pedal board and Boss and Line 6. They all have pedal boards. You can plug in a microphone. You can plug in an instrument. It's like a two-channel mixer right there. So that might be an option. And, and the uh, does the flow take a external? I mean, can you hook it to an iPad or, or anything else like that as far as control? Uh, since we haven't used them, I don't know if it does that or not. With the sliders, I don't think it will at that price because uh, I don't think the sliders are motorized. Because of that, I would really look at the XR18. I still think the XR18 is a far better product than the Flow from what I've looked at externally because you could run it with an iPad, you know, and so you could you can uh, be working on what you're doing and changing everything without having to actually uh, uh, go down that path. Next question. Uh, David Brady. Oh, this will be a good one. Uh, cable management preferences. Plastic, split coil, nylon webbing, zip ties, or Velcro preferred application for any or each. I love using Red Whips by Think Tank. and has a link to those. Anyone have any strong preferences? Okay, go ahead, Bill. Well, I'm just going to give you an alternative. I, I moved to this about 10 years ago, and it really has helped me with small cables and small attachment things. I use little Ziploc bags, and I write on the front of the bag what that a small cable attachment is the reason i do that is i have a little cardboard box on well, i think that this is i think when he's given his question he's really asking about you know cable like cable runs if you're if you're talking about nylon webbing this is really a you know how do you manage cables from one place to another oh i thought when i saw zip ties yeah. you're talking about yeah. zipping them up and putting them okay so that yeah. makes sense anyway if you just that last mm -hmm. little tiny bit um the plastic bags tell you what cables you brought to the set so if you don't fill the plastic bags you've left a cable behind you never lose cables yep yeah go ahead Stuart. velcro or electrical tape never use zip ties on coaxial cable or triaxial cable you will get signal reflections back down and you will lose your signal it takes the digital cliff on hd on belden 1694 from 112 mm -hmm. meters down to no meters go ahead roscoe uh, zip ties if it's somewhere a student is going to fiddle with it and pull it apart uh, velcro i love absolutely and then uh snakes that uh, the spiral is very helpful anytime you have multiple cables running to a camera especially is when i use those yeah the the we use velcro on every every cable has velcro on it almost every cable that we have that we roll up has has a velcro tab on it to pull it together we we do heavy use of web webbing you know, like we use a lot of webbing if it's going to be something that we, we need to, to build a kind of a snake out of. Uh, and that's been super successful for us. It's a pain in the neck to get good at doing it. You, your hands feel a little rough afterwards, but um, yeah, it's very successful. Um, go ahead, Edwin. Uh, I'm a huge fan of bongo ties. Bongo ties make up uh, for every zip tie use that I would normally have unless it's mm -hmm. massive. Go ahead, uh, JJ. Like Roscoe held up as well. The, uh, the these come in big spools, and it makes it really easy also to adjust, to take off. So these pre-built Velcro ta tabs, they're the best because and and you can get those branded so that you can have your company yeah. name on them, and most importantly, where to send them back when people find them. All right, uh, next question. Moving on, Tobias Moss of Minneapolis, Minnesota says, Alex, I know you're anti-hybrid and pro-digital first. How do you think about spaces and architecture that have special resonance for people? I'm a rabbi of a congregation in a historic and beloved building. We know that a certain number of people will keep Zooming and another number, why, uh, are desperate to be back at Temple. How do you think that's going to play out? I think that for services like that, I think that the thing to think about is how to find something else, but don't try to get it. I mean again, people can watch the service, then I think that what would be really great for a lot of those is to build a separate discussion that happens right after the service that you, you, you have the service, they get the message, then they get to talk to you about it. And I think that that would be very engaging on many levels for many different formats, whether it's uh, religious or whether it's a business thing of being able to engage that audience like we're doing here, right after the talk, it lets them hear the message. And I think that when you're when there is a direct message um, that is being spoken. I think that you can get away with, you know, a, a lot of this, especially in that type of environment. Um, but when I look at, um, I've said before, my, my 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 wife listens to a lot of a lot of uh, sermons, and she's listening to just the sermon part, <laughs> not the rest of it. And and you know, and, and she just listen to it while she works and, and does what, what she's doing. And there's not, there isn't uh, like the the there's way more of her than there. Than there is in the room for this, you know, for this, um, for the ones that she she listens to, and so 
I just get into why not even build that build a separate service for people to get it where it's very intimate and connected for the online audience. Just build something separate. I, I definitely don't think that you should give up a incredible space. I think that that is something that there is something impactful about being around a lot of people thinking about the same thing, being in the same space. So I'm not anti physical events. I just think that you need to know that it's never going to be as effective as a hybrid, you know, as a hybrid event and, and finding ways to customize experiences so that the online audience gets a great one is a, is a great way to scale your audience or scale your congregation um, because they'll feel more connected and more likely to uh, be part of, of that. That's all. It's just think of other programming for them that is more direct. Um, and we think about, again, my example is often Mr. Rogers. He's really good at digital first events. You know, like, you know, like talked right into the camera, right to the kids, you know, and, and super effective, uh, JJ Roscoe and Liberty, and then we'll move on. Okay. Move quick. But I'm running into, we can't get ahead of these questions. And our, our producers are, they're moving. All right. What I've been running into is that there is some trepidation from folks who w would like to get back to the traditional method of, uh, being present because they want to maintain that esoteric feel of, mm -hmm you have to be there to experience it. And so, so mm -hmm. uh, the digital is being removed from that. And it's, well, people feel it's like very they frustrating have to, personally. People feel like they have to be here too. So yeah, yep. go ahead, uh, go ahead, Liberty, or, or Roscoe and then Liberty. Uh, get the speaker a very stylish stool that matches the environment. Uh, get a very good camera lens, get a nice long lens and a very good tripod so that even if you have to sit farther back in the room, you can get into a nice close up on that individual and make it more intimate. And really, the one thing to think about for the individual is to post, which what, what I mean by that is stay in one place when they're making important moments and then find ways to zoom in so that you get that when you want to make a point. Whatever matters, you stop, stop, stop walking, you know, and, and then the camera operators learn to zoom in at that moment when they, when they reach a post and they're not moving, zoom in and get that classic, this is, this means something. Um, if they don't care about, if nothing means anything, then just keep pacing. Uh, go ahead, Liberty. And then also with um, like at our children at our church, they do separate programming for the different communities. So the kids communities, the adults. So that might be something as well. So that yeah. you're you're breaking it up so that hybrid works, but then also that community at the end of the day, it's all community, whether it's hybrid or whether it's digital. And we should think about that community being global, not Chicago or Houston or Atlanta, mm -hmm. but really like your community now can be as big as the world is. Um, next question. Uh, Jason Panks in Nashville, Tennessee says, Zoom room question, looking to get an Amazon Echo to enable 720p HD in meetings. Anything needed besides buying an Echo Show 8? I don't think so. I think that's all you gotta do. And then, and then you join the meeting and you're off to the races. Jeffrey, real quick. The better thing to do is just to go into support and ask for the HD support, because they'll give that to you and you don't even have to worry about the show they might give it to you and this the show get lets you do it to any account that's the big advantage of that um next question johnny estias in Mil uh, in manila uh amazon web service announced this month that elemental media live now supports html5 motion graphics overlay such as singular live has anyone on the panel used singular live not yet it's a, it's a great <laughs> We've been wanting this uh, to be able to do this for about a decade of uh, being able to add graphics um, and lower thirds and other bits and pieces to the stream post production. And so we're interested in it. Just haven't had time to work on it yet. No, no, uh, no request for it yet. Next question. Uh, Jan Landy of Las Vegas says, why is the sound level meter in negative rather than positive mode? Go ahead, Stuart. Because at zero, you overdrive and you start to deteriorate your signal. So you always want to be lower than zero. Yep. Zero is the is distortion. It's full signal. Um, next, uh, go ahead, Mickey. And yeah, that is how uh, full scale is. The, the digital uh, scale for, for metering audio is always uh, in negative. Zero is peaking, as mentioned earlier. Um, next question. 
Sky Gleason of Seattle says, Jeffrey Powers, please spell the word you use to help define the different types of music. Why and how does music affect us? Can we have a second hour to discuss the definition of art and product? Big questions. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. So uh, earlier on, I was talking about this video we watched, which is a guy that was talking about needle drops in these and called them diagenic and non-diagenic. And I think I'm saying the name right, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't know how to spell it. But yeah, he was talking about Tarantino and Scorsese and how they use music to uh, push the story along. And that would be a great second hour, yes. Fun to get a composer to come in and talk about that. Um, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, essentially, like diage when you when in context of uh, narratives, uh, diegetic sounds are sounds that actually occur in the scene. So, like you know, a car driving by in the scene, that's a diegetic sound, or, or a radio playing. But a sound that occurs outside of the of the scene, like musical score, that's non diegetic. Can you Next spell question. that for me, Mickey? Yeah. Right. Put it, we'll put it in, in, in Mukana. we got to move fast. Next question. Todd Reynolds from North Adams, Massachusetts. Uh, future Studios. Oh, that's for Future Studios. That's for next hour. Sorry about that. Let me move it back over. Please yeah. use the, when you can, if you're listening, um, please, there is a tag. You'll see a little little arrow on the right. When you're asking the question, you can tag it as second hour. And it shows up differently on the back end for us. And so it's easier for us to see. No, next question. Alton Christensen of Brooklyn says, any thoughts on the most recent Oprah remote interview with Amanda Gorman? Oprah is in Hawaii. Uh, Ms. Gorman is likely in LA or New York. Seem much improved. And there she has a, or, or he or she has a link to both clips. I thought it looked a lot better. That's still a little weird, but but not, but not much better than, it, than the Obama one. Go ahead, Roscoe. It got color corrected in post, so it, it matches so much better. I think that, that added a lot of uh, seamlessness to it. Yeah, it, it was, I mean, obviously they learned. <laughs> there's, so, there's still uh, contact ash, ish, issues with their feet. I, 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 the problem is I, I uh, immediately, as soon as I see someone's feet, <laughs> I look down and, uh, and to see if, they're, if the contact shadows are working and they didn't. Um, so, uh, so I think that overall, I think it's good. I think sometimes they pushed it a little too far where they're trying to sell it. So there's a really short depth of the field in a way that felt a little unnatural because you can, you know, and I've done that to so so it that's the temptation and so that takes a little bit away from it um i felt but uh but they got the eye lines right the audio sounded much more conversational so i think that they it's a really interesting uh really interesting format i don't need all the as a viewer i don't need all the pageantry you know i'm fine with them just talking to each other remotely <laughs> you know like like you know i'm fine with like this, having them talk back and forth. I don't know if I need them to feel like they're in one room to go through all of that trouble to, to just have a conversation seemed like a, um, something that someone sold somebody to make a lot, you know, and made a lot of money on it. <laughs> all right, next question. Nigel Dissaw of Austin, Texas. Alex, during the pre-show, you show the Nobi Omniscope. If we were to get a copy, should we look at the two or three key scopes to get the best color and zoom for our Blackmagic cameras? Yeah, so let me see if I can pop that up. Um, the uh, the scope is a it's a pretty. Um, this is what I was showing earlier. I'll just pop it in here, and oh, I think I'll I think we found that if I if I cut to it, then it will be analyzing itself, and then you get a loop. So let me uh, screen share it real quick. Uh, this is what I was. Um, so this is me in here. <laughs> this is the this is the the uh, Omni scope. Uh, the one that I think is important is the vector scope that you see over here, uh, the RGB parade that you see over here. Those are probably the two most important. The rest of them are me fiddling, um, but those are the two that I'm looking at primarily. The other ones I'm – so a lot of what I'm doing is often calibrating my eye to what all of these scopes mean. So when I look at them, what should I be looking at? And I play with them in my – the great thing about this is the interaction of a scope – along with um, an ATEM and a, and a Blackmagic camera is that you can interactively very quickly just sit at your desk and play around with the inputs. And you're learning what's happening to the signal when I change this thing in, in the ATEM. Uh, and that is uh, super powerful as far as learning how all those things work. So the other ones are for me to, I open up lots of scopes so that my brain is slowly as assimilating what that means, because I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know why I would, the one that I look at is the vector scope and the RGB parade are the two that I care about the most. Um, and then the other ones are me figuring out whether that's useful or not. 
Um, but it's, it's a great set of scopes. Um, go ahead, uh, Chris, real quick, and then we'll move on. Yeah, when you, okay, so there's a lot of people hearing you say the reason you look at the vector scope is, is important. Can you explain to them why you're looking at the vector scope? Yeah, so you'll notice that I look a little less red than I did yesterday. It's because I was rotating, you know, I was rotating my hue, um, but I, I rotated it by, if, if we look at this, um, if I screen share this again, if I, uh, so here is, I, I, I actually got my skin to go right along this level here. Um, and so, uh, I can rotate that in, I can adjust something that just literally has it just spin around like a clock and we can go into that in the second hour probably is, is, is a do again for these scopes and color correction. Um, but I find that I can't color correct my, usually if I look off, it means I, I was trying to do it without scopes for what, for some reason. Um, so I, it's, it's really valuable to have scopes. And you can get a 14 day thing and that thing, by the way, when you get out of 14 days, it just quits every five minutes. So you can just turn it on, make your adjustments and then let it die. <laughs> so, so, you, you know, so it's like, it's a great little, you know, like, you, you know, and then you can decide somewhere down the road, you want to spend $400 on it, but it's totally useful just in the, in the, after the 14 day demo, it's totally useful for months because you just, it just opens up, you, you make your adjustments and let it, let it just turn off. It saves all your settings and everything else. All right. Next question. Richard Mullane of Lidmerick, Ireland is next. With those using Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K or 6Ks as a webcam, are you using the flat film output with a LUT or the video output settings specifically for live Zoom meetings? For live Zoom meetings, I highly recommend the video, the film to extended video. Um, the film to video is way too punchy because it, uh, Zoom will increase the contrast and the saturation automatically. So using the extended and then using the eight, that's the first step. And you'll look pretty good without any correction or relatively. With the ATEM, then you can, you clip the blacks a little bit and you clip the whites a little bit more from the extended and it'll look even better. So, um, but extended video is one. And again, we're being delayed by me, but you know, Charles is open to doing kind of, we're going to learn how to build LUTs for our, for our uh, cameras so that we can all have zoom LUTs that look just great on zoom. All right. Next question. Gabriel Ung in Malaysia says, thinking of using Amazon Web Services virtual machine instances for media playback, what Windows apps offer similar flexibility or play of playback like QLab? Content needs to be played on Q and something and sometimes loop until the next Q is triggered. I go ahead, Roscoe. Well, come on Saturday and make a Raspberry Pi. That'll give you a ability to Well, I think he needs something. to put it in the cloud. I think oh, he needs to be totally in the cloud. Yeah, he, it's totally in the cloud. He's trying to do it in AWS. I, I don't know of playout systems that I'm particularly happy with on Windows. Um, just trying to think. Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. If ever you're running vMix, uh, you could certainly utilize vMix for that purpose. You can loop things, and you can also uh, just you know trigger. I know that there there are some. Imagine I think builds builds a really high end one. I'm just trying to think of something that's a little less uh, aggressive. Um, but in the event world, I think probably part of the problem is the event world is very Mac <laughs> driven for you know when it comes to playback. So um, so it's just a matter of figuring that out. JJ and then and then Jeffrey, real quick. I don't know why you couldn't just build Jonas's thing on the cloud because Jonas hasn't built it yet. So uh, I think he's working on a Windows version, uh, uh, but but I think that Jonas is, is still a work in progress. I mean, I think it's great and it's great value. When you're talking about really pushing it in under the stress of events, I think it's still st still on its way. Um, Jeffrey, I think you could do it with uh, BitFocus Companion. Even if you don't have a Stream Deck, you should be able to something. Yeah, what's the with, app? Uh, time spaces, uh, Companion itself. Companion you, will you can, uh, do playback. You, like you, I, yeah. Well, you'd have to well, run things like VLC or something like that to to do playback. But uh, it's, I've it's, seen people use VLC. VLC is not a professional solution for playback in a in an event. <laughs> like it's just not. Agreed. You know, like Agreed. so so it's it's and I just don't know what the professional versions are on the on the PC. We'll we'll, we'll think about that some more. Um, next question. Henry Ramos of Yonkers, New York says, "Bald talent, backlight or no?" Uh, go ahead, Bill, real quick. So for me, if I have somebody who is follically challenged, I always try to do a point source light, something like a chip on board LED or something like that, and a cutter. So literally a black panel so that you can bring down, if you have too high a specular highlight, mm -hmm. 
from that back angle of instance toward the camera, that to me is the best solution for dealing. I like to refer to it as I like to refer to it as aerodynamic. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, uh, Mickey and then and then Jeffrey, uh, real real fast. All right. Uh, the 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 purpose of uh, using a backlight is to separate your subject from the background, and there are numerous ways to do that. You can do it with tweaking the background in terms of lighting, your framing, and uh, color, color color selection. But if in your case, uh, a backlight works best, then a backlight works best. Go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. I've seen backlights also, they hit my shoulders too. So that can, uh, that can definitely uh, yep. separate me out. Absolutely. Next question. Uh, Jan Landy of Las Vegas. I stream my Zoom show to YouTube and multiple Facebook pages and Periscope. Everyone on the panel knows that we stream live. After the show, I got a call from one of the panel to delete a comment they made in around the one hour mark. Can and how would I do that? It happens a lot. People just say more than they should have in, in the heat of the moment. Uh, the problem is, is to delete that, you, you will need to cut You'll need to literally take the take the video down and do an edit or build a new video. You'll lose the the view count that you had when you did that, and then you'll repost it as another video, or YouTube will create it for you and repost it. But either way, you're going to get a new URL wherever you made that update. Um, and so, uh, but it's it's common. I've made that request. You know, I've done stuff. I've said stuff on MacBreak that I I emailed John Selena. <laughs> hey, can you cut that out before you post it? So um, uh, so that's not an unusual request. Um, but it is an argument for not streaming to too many platforms at one time, but it's um, something that we think about a lot, uh, Sky. In YouTube, you can trim the head and the tail, but that does create a new instance. It used to not. Correct? It used to not, but it seems to now. Like it, it seems okay, that trimming the head and tail seems to create a new one. I don't understand why. It used to be a simple thing that would just trim. Uh, Jeffrey? Yeah, I think it's a, it has to do with live videos versus recorded videos, and uh, I've seen it. You know, we just did one a couple weeks ago where it was like one second that we had to take out, and we had to create a new one. And of course, it, it can bounce. I thought well, it would the, be under an hour, but then not to be true. But then there were a couple videos that did work, so it's it's yeah, all the, over the, the board now. The, the edit in the center makes sense. It's the trims that used to work great, and now they seem to always want to create. Like ever since YouTube went to the new platform with the new interface, they've ruined it. And so, but I mean, music, they will suck the music out, or they'll just put black holes. Yeah, over they'll it. do that. They'll no, they'll suck the music out. They'll just say, "Hey, you've got a copyright from here to here," and we'll take that out. Um, do they do they black hole it for the length, no, or do they, they just cut it? And they actually do a so pretty it good can job. Be done. It's a scene cut. Well, so they do it. it you. Oh, yeah. okay. Next question. Uh, Mark Bridges in Covina, California, says, "Can you use three hundred and sixty cameras in live events? And if so, what does that entail, and how does that work?" So I've done a lot of 360 in live events. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to answer this one really quickly since we're, you can do it. Uh, just the thing that you want to look at is that your the the distance to the person that you want that you want to look at needs to be between three and 15 feet, um, three feet, because you'll start to see seams when it's closer than three feet, uh, 15 feet, because it's not interesting after that. I mean, it's just a, it's just a 1D, you know, whatever you can't, there's not enough resolution yet to have that experience. And so that is the thing that you want to look at. We've done actually multi-cam for connect facebook connect we did multi-cam stereo 4k per eye you know so we had five ozos that were all being switched and streamed with uh in in left and right eye 4k and so you can definitely do it was it worth it i don't know you know it's it is a uh, um venues is is facebook's product that they're working on pretty hard that's a 180 rather than a 360 and that's where most people are going because they're, what we found was is that A, people don't look behind them very often, and B, cutting down to 180 from, from 360 makes the whole production way easier because you're not worried about what's going on behind them. You're not worried about all those other things. And so, so those are the things that we found so far. So I think that the 180 stereo and 180, um, you'll notice that you know Apple bought uh, whatever next VR, that's all they do. <laughs> so we can assume that, that there's probably going to be some interest in that. But 360, I think, has a value. I'm not sure if it has a value in classrooms or in it's it's gimmicky in classrooms and events. I mean, that's that's my as someone who did it a lot, it's gimmicky as tours like we did one for the Mars, the Mars TV show that is shot in Budapest, where we had five Ozos and they were talking about the set. The set designers were talking about the set and the show and being able to have 360 and look around while you're listening to them talk was amazing. So there are places that it's great. But on a standard stage, I mean, the standard stage in 16 by nine isn't that interesting, let alone putting it in 360. All right, next question. 
Moving on to Michael Marsh. Michael Marsh says, really no power button on the ATEM Mini, really? Uh, what's the best way to power off at night? Is a power strip safe enough? I'm assuming we don't leave them on all the time. Make that noise. Yeah, you just pull it out. It's it's fine. Or you can put it on a switch. It's designed, it's, it's designed to do that. And the reason you do that is so someone doesn't inadvertently turn it off. Uh, Chris uh, Fritchie. Uh, my A10 Mini has been on for almost a year continuously. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so yeah, but it's but yeah, it, it, and mine's been on probably for months or not or extreme since it showed up. But but uh, but it's oh no, it hasn't been. I, I restarted every once in a while because Zoom goes gray, so it gets restarted about once or twice a week because Zoom goes gray, and then I have to restart it to get it to go back. Our next question. Moving on to Mark Bridges of Covina, California, and Mark says um, a Mackie. DL32R with Dante works great for tracking live recordings without disturbing the chief audio engineer. However, I've noticed the Behringer for uh, X32 mentioned a lot on office hours. Is this because the control surface is preferred over the iPad control or the quality of hardware? Mickey? Um, I, I have no experience with the, with the Mackie, but uh, definitely uh, you would most of the time want uh, actual physical faders. So you can quickly grab uh, grab a channel when when you when you need to, and I would also dare say that the preamps on the X32 would probably be a little better than the one on the Mackie. And the Mackie is considerably more expensive than the than the uh, X32. For I I'd be really surprised. I don't know, but I'd be really surprised if Mackie did a better job than Behringer's done uh, for twice the price. Um, go ahead, Victor. Yeah, the new X 32s do use uh, the Midas preamps, so they are quite a bit better. Uh, next question. Comes to us from Victor, who was just chatting. And Victor says, what's the recommended SSH application to use on Mac to connect to a PI? Pi. Pi. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, the, uh, was it, I, for me, it would be the terminal. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. Oh, you're, you're, you're muted. Uh, I'm going to say uh, uh, iTerminal uh, if you want a third party or a terminal. Yeah. yeah, but terminal on the Mac is, is pretty uh, pretty useful. I would highly recommend playing with it. It's pretty awesome. Mickey? Uh, also check out the on a Mac Putty. Mm -hmm. Next question. Sam Greenwood of Toronto, Canada is up next. And Sam says, I've been meaning to ask this for a while. Um, are there any types of events that you think will stay predominantly in person? What do you think will happen to things like Comic-Con that are community-based? When brands realize that they can build a much, much, much larger audience that generates revenue online in, a in an online community based around their brand, Comic-Con will be in big trouble. You know, like it's because they can do it. They can instead of doing it for a room of five hundred, they could do it for a room of fifty thousand. You know, and ha and how because getting a hold of the talent is really hard. <laughs> you know, and so if you can impact five hundred and uh, fifty thousand instead of five hundred, it's going to be a really hard sell um, to make that work. Are there physical events that make sense? Absolutely. Big. You know, I work in. I work. I've worked some events that, you know, it's three hundred people, but they move a billion dollars or two two billion dollars worth of sales for a big for an advertising company and yeah you do a whole physical event for them uh, so that that makes a lot of sense go ahead chris and then bill and then stewart yeah the, i mean that's an interesting point you bring up there but half of comic-con is people watching i mean how are you going to handle that i mean not being able to go see everybody it, dress up is it's just fundamentally i mean but you have to look at roi for the companies that are involved like that's Comic -Con, the company, there is the, for the people going yeah, but, to Comic Con. But if the company stop going, like will they will the people still come? I mean, you can get what you what you're missing out of it, and you have to find another way to do that. I'm just saying that for the companies involved, the ROI will be so much higher online that they may still participate for a while. I'm not saying any of this is going to happen over a year, but I'm saying over 10 years, they're going to stop going because they're going to be able to get 500,000 people to show up for that round table or, or 50,000 or whatever. And they're just going to be like, it's so hard to get the actors and they pay so much to have them there that, that, you know, we can just do this online, you know, and, and they're going to, it's just going to go that direction. Go ahead, Bill. And then Stuart. I'm going to respectfully disagree on this one. As a 15-year Comic-Con attendee, it has almost nothing to do with the presentation and almost everything to do with the physical meeting of community there. I just think that kind of thing is an exception. I agree with you 100% on lots of other kinds of things. It might, people difference. might still go, but I'm just saying, I don't know if those big the big rollouts in those events will happen. That's all. It can affect uh, the chatter on the entire world about 
uh, breaking comic oriented content, because that's the biggest content in the world now. Uh, Marvel, DC, they rule the universe. And these are the core fans who truly want to be with themselves and their group. It is tribal. It is hugely tribal. And I don't think it's going to change. Okay. Uh, Stuart? I think Bill's absolutely spot on there. The Comic-Con is the event to go to worldwide if you're into comics or cosplay. The one thing that I think will absolutely change is Bane and Sub-Zero are going to become a lot more popular because the costumes include a mask. <laughs> there you go. And Dune. <laughs> I can't believe that someone didn't re release a Dune mask because it looks so cool. And I was like, why didn't someone just release one of those? I would have bought one. Yes. All right, next next question. All right, moving to Peter uh, Pergahoffer, Perga looks like from Vienna, Austria, is in Nexus. Has anyone played or worked with meeting solutions like wonder.me, gather.town, or workadventure.re? What are your impressions or opinions? I know that Leo, who is not here right now, has played with gather.town. Um, I have not, um, you know, played with most of this. I still feel like they're very skeuomorphic. Like we're trying to figure out a way to give people something that feels like it was the old thing. And I do still feel like you should do the old thing. If you want to do the old thing, if you're doing the new thing, uh, you should do the new thing. So, so it's, so that's, that's my, uh, that's my opinion of most of them that I've seen so far. Um, anybody else? Uh, next question. Gabriel Ung of Malaysia is back with, hi, is there an issue with not getting audio from the Blackmagic Ultra Studio mini recorder into Zoom meetings? Are there fixes or workarounds? This question has come up before, so there must be some issue in some instances where the audio is not going through. I don't know what that is. Like, I don't know what's causing that. Um, and I admit that I almost never bond video and audio uh, to Zoom. So I, I don't know because I haven't tested it. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, just as a trouble, troubleshooting step, uh, double check that the audio is actually getting into the, through your, that SDR HMI connection. Because uh, mm. it, it, it might not just your camera or whatever source you're feeding uh, that SDI out of um, might just might not be feeding. Next question. Uh, Mark Harder of Brooklyn says, thanks to Chris Fenwick for being such a webcam ninja, firing up his phone for a webcam the other day. Inspirational. What methods do you all use to connect a phone quickly to a second, uh, to be a second or third webcam? My methodology, and I just use it for the cooking thing that we did last week, is uh, Filmic Pro does a clean output um, to via HDMI to my ATEM. Uh, you definitely want to use the expensive Apple AV connector, uh, Liberty and Chris are both showing it. Do not get something less. You'll just waste money because half the time it, it'll work at, at the beginning. And for some reason, just stop working. I had a bunch of cables that I, I got, I started using, and then they stopped working and connectors and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure the OS is identifying them and turning them off or something, but um, the Apple AV connectors are the way to use it. And, and then and, I think people if, are, if you use an extended length of cable, you will need to power it. will need to yeah. be powered. Yeah, and then and then the uh, there's Epic Cam, there's NDI HX. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, if if I just quickly need to show something, uh, I use Epic Cam because it uh, you could hook it up to your computer wirelessly, and not and not through NDI. And the, yeah, and then but the NDI HX does work with things like Memo Live and and other other uh, platforms works really well. Um, Jeffrey and then Jan, real quick. If you use any of those cables, very important to that you kind of stretch it out so it doesn't hang from the phone. Because if it hangs from the phone, two things could happen. One, you could bust out the uh, plug right there. And the other one is the cable starts to bend and, of course, the wires start to break from there. So if you can straighten it out as best as possible, you'll get a, you'll have a long-lasting cable. Yep. Go ahead, Jan, real quick. Uh, Camo is another uh, iPhone yep. app. I'm curious to know if anybody knows any Android apps that would work. I think Epic Cam is on, on Android as well. Yeah. So I think that'd be the one. Yeah. Next question. Uh, Tim Holm of San Lorenzo says, if you had one Tim available, $300, <laughs> you personally purchase next for your own media production. Well, I can tell you what I just purchased for, I, I, yeah, there's a stream deck. Stream deck's a good one. What I did just purchase is the, is the, from, from a uh, guy is the road 
two. <laughs> so that's $300. In fact, I got, of course, I bought two of them because I'm going to use them for IFB. And, and so, so mine didn't cost $300, but I, each one was $300. Anyone else? You know, have to think about that one a little bit. Um, ask that again, because now you have us all thinking about it. Ask it another day and we'll, we'll come up with some more things. Uh, next question. Stuart Fairweather on the panel here from Melbourne, Australia, flashing the latest firmware into a network, a new tech Spark HX, and wondering why do companies release hardware with unfinished firmware? The new firmware finally allows the SD card slot to work. Uh, note, yes, vision via Spark tonight, audio may be out of sync. I think that it comes down to, you know, uh, quarterly results <laughs> sometimes. Go ahead, Sky. Yes, exactly. Because marketing's job is to sell stuff and that's hit their numbers. And if engineering even gives a hint that they have a product that might have a profitability for the market marketing people to look good in front of their, their boss, they're going to sell it whether it's ready or not. And H264, to my justification, is that exact point in case or case in point. It's not, well, it's not a delivery device. Right, and there's not a capture that, device. It's a great delivery device. The key is making sure that it has a it's valuable for what you bought it for uh, at that time, and then it just gets more valuable. No, Stuart, Chris, and Jeffrey, but like ten seconds each, we're going to go to the next question. Yeah, I should point out that the new firmware for the Spark is basically what it should have had when it was released, mm -hmm. and they're not the only ones. Atomus do this all the time, and often don't finish firmware for products even when the new ones come out and they've gone end of line yep. for whatever you had. Go ahead, uh, Chris, and then Jeffrey, 10 seconds. Oh, go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. I, I have the original Spark, and that card's always worked, but uh, the Mevo Start was another one where they said that they had NDI to it, but the NDI at the beginning was horrible. Yep. But the other features about it, like the six-hour battery, worked perfect, so that's why they sent it out, not because of the NDI. Next question. Jan Landy in Las Vegas uh, is up again with, in the Mac environment, what software is the panel using to memorize the screen position on your Zoom windows, or do you reorganize your Zoom windows on an active basis, uh, for example, uh, as in with Moom? Uh, I am constantly moving my screens. <laughs> it's just like a constant reordering them, resizing them, moving them around, uh, trying to figure out what I like and don't like, and so I don't, I don't have that sensitivity. Uh, John and then Victor, real quick, 10 seconds. Can't hear you. Jan, I'm sorry, Jan. Jan. Maybe I said I threw it to the wrong um, person. Yeah, I use a program called Moom, but it doesn't do what I want it to. I know there are other apps that will remember where your screen position is because I, you know, we've got three windows open. You got the the second window, you've got the the gallery view, you got mm. participants, and then you got Makana. And every time I'm constantly rearranging my screens, it would be yeah. great if there was an app that just remembered the positions. Yep. Yep. Uh, Victor, real quick. Yes, front and center. Um, look it up on the Mac store. It is designed to give you the layering policy on your Mac the way it used to in classic made by John Syracuse. He has two apps, look them both up. They do just these things. They're like four bucks. Mickey? Oh. Um, yeah, I, I was gonna say that uh, for most of the windows uh, that uh, Zoom puts up, like the participants win window, uh, it doesn't register itself to the OS in a way that could uh, typically be uh, uh, arranged. But I, I guess not since, uh, well, what do you call this? Uh, Victor has a solution for it. Uh, last question for the first hour. It's not really a question so much as Renee Cuero in uh, Luzak said, how can I get in touch with Mickey from Manila? And so that's up to Mickey. <laughs> how much Discord. Is this Discord. Who, when do we put out Discord now? I realize I'm completely disconnected from that, that experience. <laughs> we we got are... the Chatimator uh, autom automation tool. And it, it, does, does, does he put it into into Mukana? Six yeah, forty. And, and Chad. All right. Yeah. So um, so anyway. So thank you, Chad, again for for doing that. Uh, so if if by the way, if you're looking for the Discord, is, is the Discord link still go out at six forty or six thirty? What what time does the Discord link go out? Do we do we know? Six forty. Perfect. <laughs> and he I, has a very amusing uh, what do you call this chat messages that he creates every day. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right. Awesome. Uh, all right. So we're jumping in the second, uh, second um, uh, hour. Uh, I think that we're going to talk a little bit about the future of studios. I, I want to try to keep it away from too much of like routing. 
um, like w whether we're going to use SDI or NDI or, or whatever. But I think that really creatively, what do we get, what do we need to be able to execute uh, inside of those um, uh, those studios, and what do they have to be able to do? Um, and so I think that I just don't want to d dive too much. I can see myself diving into talking about uh, NDI versus twenty one ten or or whatever, and that'll be that'll be a, a different conversation. But I do think that it's worth us talking about the. There are going to be physical environments that we need to create um, that are different than what we've had in the past. And I don't think that most, I, I, I have this conversation with people and they say, well, there's studios everywhere. I'm like, yeah. And none of those studios are, studios are useful to me. <laughs> you know, I have to basically go in, like we go into like NEP studios and literally leave their control room where it is and just load boxes in. You know, like like load our cases in and completely take over um, because we can't use any of the, the, the million dollar you know, studio and all those cameras are not useful to us, you know, and so and so we've been having that problem for five years. And so I thought that it'd be useful to talk about what do we need? And why do we do that? And so, uh, so if you have questions about studios, or, you know, those types of things, as you start to go down that path, uh, go ahead and put them in, in Mukana. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I just real quick before they write their questions. Do you mean studios as in uh, for live events or for? Yeah, yeah. Events? I mean, for the for okay. the future, kind of the studios for like the next generation of, of events. So we really we start talking about these events uh, that they're now. And I, and I will admit, I strongly believe that the that participatory media is the future. <laughs> like what we're doing here is some hint to it. This isn't what we're doing here is not the future, but it is a it points in the future's direction, you know, and and so uh, that that we're going to want to be more interactive. I think that the studios will need to be connected to each other. So, you know, instead of having a, a studio that is broadcasting out like this, I think what what we're really looking, what I believe we're looking for, and you guys can, you know, have your, you know, this is a discussion, but I think that we're looking at the the need to have a studio in San Francisco, we'll say, um, a, we'll back it up, go backwards in LA. Um, we have one in New York. And we need to be able to intercut these so that they can all talk to each other. We're also gonna have people that are watching this on their little cell phones or on their TVs. And then we're, we may even have groups of people that are watching them on a screen. And we need to take all of this, turn it into a show, be able to interact with any one of these groups and and turn that into something and that is a different kind of thing than we have um that i've done it a lot but i don't know very many other people that have had to, to do that and what we find the reason and the reason i brought this up is that when i do it i have to re-gear every studio i work in to be able to do the thing that i'm trying to do um bill and then jeff and then mickey and then chris Having spent a lot of time at users groups doing presentations and stuff like that, and you travel into some place and you bring your laptop and you're going to connect it to the presenter or to the presentation projector for a big group. And then you've got the 30 things that go wrong. And I just hope we, we get past that somehow, whether you walk in with your laptop, an iPad, your phone or whatever, I hope in the future, there is some sort of communications consistency. So you don't have these problems of, oh gosh, the, well, you know, so to their machine it's connected on my fonts everything's a mess what, what you're pointing to again is the fact that the studio the, the theater that you're walking into wasn't built for what you're doing mm -hmm. and this is what we have to think about is having these um locations you know built so that they can absorb that now i don't speak in physically almost ever anymore because i don't i want to be able to do this right and i want to be able to cut you know to show things and talk about things and the chances of that being built on site is very low. And so I just tell people, I'll just come in. I've been for the last five years, I just like, I'll just come in online, you know, like, and I, and I, I have a, I, my system's better than yours. <laughs> you know, and so I don't, I don't need to be here just, but the big, then the big problem we've had is that those event locations don't have the bandwidth to support a high bandwidth connection, which I think is going to be intrinsic to the future is, uh, you know, like for instance, a convention center charges you so much money for the bandwidth that nobody does it. So these rooms don't have the bandwidth and that, that reality I think is going to change because of COVID. These uh, the event centers have to have better and maybe they'll budget just way more to be connected, but it, it, it also could be something, but to your point, Bill, that they're just not built for it. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, go ahead, uh, Jeff, and then who was and Mickey, I think, and then and then Chris. 
Yeah, I I agree with you completely, Alex. And I think that we are already headed down that direction. I, I feel like that a lot of people are thinking this way. Uh, at least yeah. the, the people I've been around, they're definitely thinking about it this way. We're in the middle of building a studio right now, not for ourselves, but for a client. And it, it's really tough to say, okay, which direction do we go? Because he's like you, he, he leans more towards what he knows, which is hardware and, and hard wiring and such. And so that's where the majority of the studios are going to be centric around. But whenever you start talking about, I want to be able to connect to here and to here and to here, that's IT, that's IP. And so mm -hmm. we should be thinking about that. But if you could build your studio into that infrastructure already it just makes that transverse much easier for down the road and it's not in the far future it's like right now we need well, that functionality right now yeah yeah absolutely and and part of it is also thinking about really low latency you know like truly low latency so the reason that most of the studio work that we've done where we connect studios where we have a budget we're using the switch is because the switch is doing like 25 to 50 milliseconds like it is like there you know, and, and so anytime we go, it, you know, LTN then steps up the latency, then SRT steps it up again. And so, and it, you can feel it. Like when you, you, like when you're working in it, when you get used to it, like I've spent years just doing switch work and you get used to that and the, and you can, that you can see the person's reaction as the person's speaking, that reconnection of that becomes important. Now you don't need to do that. You can do, for instance, this is where I think things get interesting is that you know, the switch is taking advantage of dark fiber. It's taking advantage of Nimbras. It's taking advantage of things that we can put in hardware in those studios. We don't, the switch provides some reliability, interconnection, easy to schedule and everything else. But I think you can build switch like networks uh, between studios that don't require that, but they do require fiber connections, you know, to every studio that is ready to absorb that and be part of that network where those studios are hard line between it. And I think that, um, I think almost every studio should have switch LTN, the ability to do SRT, the ability to do Zixi into the cloud, the, you know, like all of those things are part of what I think what, to what Jeff's talking about. You do have to be ready to go into the cloud, you know, to, to make this work. And the, and the, and even though we're, you know, we're working slowly and own, I know we're working slowly to, we have a bunch of hardware, but we're looking at a physical space as well as oh, 3210 has a big space as well as how do we keep on building capacity in the cloud to extend all of those things? How do we do the things that we have to do physically? There are things that we have to do because of the kind of work that we're doing. But how do we then keep going and and building it into AWS, which is why we did the Friday sessions and why we'll keep on talking about AWS. Uh, Mickey and then and then Chris and then Sky. I think we talk uh, a lot about here uh, regarding bringing in contributors remotely uh, into the studio. Um, I think one thing that needs to be m more uh, thought of a, a bit more and built out by especially like the hardware manufacturers is how we can bring in, uh, you know, technicians and engineers to operate all these gear remotely. We're doing a lot of things to work around that and, and you know, control mixers from, from a, a remote location. But I think uh, the, it has to at least uh, more broadly start from the manufacturers and and for them to incorporate that functionality uh, straight out of the box. Yeah, being able to set up handshakes anywhere in the world would be useful. <laughs> you know, like saying, you know, being like, for instance, you can do that, Teranek, uh, Teradex do that fairly well, where you have, if you have core, you can kind of subscribe. You can have one that's going into the thing and then one that's going out, but, but, and they don't have to have, you know, they don't have to have the same relationship that a lot of our other hardware does. Uh, but but to get to your point, like the way we manage a lot of that, and some of you are going to see this as we keep on growing what we're doing, uh, is VPNs. You know, so we let people, we have, v you know, and I still think, again, the way we've connected studios in the past from that perspective is that we have a studios, all these studios that we have here are all connected. And for us, it's a Meraki, but it could be a variety of other things. They're all part of the same network, you know, and so I have the IPs. I can control any switcher, any camera, any a uh, uh, mixer online all the time. You know, I can shade the cameras or change the volume on one person from any one of these locations to the other. And they, it doesn't matter where in the world they are. And that makes, um, you know, and one of the things that we definitely, as we think about these next generation studios, we're pretty careful about the idea of, we don't want to put equipment in that is not IP accessible. 
you know, if I, if I can't get to it remotely, I don't want to have it in the pipeline because now I'm relying on a person on the ground to make a change for me, which is something that we do at last resort. Uh, Chris? Yeah, so just to define this a little bit more, what I'm hearing from just a few minutes of this conversation, this is all about intercontinental or cross-continental connectivity between- It could, be all, it could all be in the same city too. But what about somebody like me, who's just a marketing person at a small company? Is this is this a, a I, studio discussion for somebody like me, or is this? Yeah, uh, we're talking about something bigger because that's where we went. But you're going to bring yeah. it back. To, you're going to bring it back to the back okay. to uh, reality here, which is great. The I think that every uh, company and and people can chime chime in on this, but I think that every company should have a small studio like what you've built um, that is there to engage their their audience and have q and a's and interaction i think that that once you build the studio once you build the capacity to project from the company i think that the companies are going to do this all the time the problem is is that all the setup is expensive all the cameras are, and you've already done a lot of that right on your end chris um and so all the setup is expensive the lighting is expensive the getting everything ready is expensive but once you get through that the actual execution of live streams becomes very inexpensive. And if you can get to your audience, so being able to um, look at a close up of your of your hardware and be able to circle things and talk about them and have 3D models that you can open up, you can actually have a more meaningful relationship with your audience um, than you could on a stage floor. Right. You know, if you were if you were out in an expo, you can talk, but you've got some of the equipment there and it's all piled up and everything else. What if you could spin it around in front of them and then you could draw on it and you could talk about it, do an exploded view, do, um, you know, show the physical one, uh, go outside and use it in a place that you wouldn't be able to do in the expo. So those studios. Now, the key is making sure that a uh, it doesn't take very many people to run and B, it's really fluid and you can get back and forth. That's why, you know. These like these extremes work really well because I get a bunch of inputs and they're all HDMI and, and mostly what I want to show you is HDMI. And so they're all like I can I can jump from one thing to the other really fast. Um, and But I see these as and then with software, it's the same thing. I want to be able to to jump to something in software and be able to circle the items that I want to talk about. And so building. But I think part of it is, is building an interactive studio, building the tools, whether it's telestrators, it's the ability to manipulate 3D, it's the ability to have video cameras that are showing on things. Those things are going to be really important to companies to, and again, as a personal, like a personal, you know, product where like for you, you may have, I don't know how many uh, offices do you have? Do you have one office or do you have many offices? Yeah, we have, you know, one in Canada, a couple here, a couple in South America. So imagine having one room in every office that's a broadcast but that brought that room is something you could control from your house right so you can you have pan tilt zoom cameras and they might have some of the tools there. there there might be a really big one at headquarters and then there's satellites that have smaller ones and all of those are connected so that you can talk back and forth between any of them so you can have a two-way converse low latency conversation between any one of those headquarters any one of those buildings sorry, I couldn't hear what sorry siri started talking um the uh but you could be able to talk back and forth so basically you have a web of studios that are able to manage multiple languages, multiple communities, multiple, but at any point in time, you could light them up and talk to each other and interact with each other and interact with the audience and interact with a, with a remote space and have them all be able to see that. That's the tricky part of, uh, as you start to think about it, but you could start with just a great studio at home, you know, not at home, but in the office, and then keep on adding to that. And Blackmagic has made it a lot easier to do a lot of that without <laughs> very much money. Uh, go ahead, uh, Sky. Connectivity of ideas. That's what I'm hearing as we're moving away from the real estate, because in Eugene, Oregon, the Comcast, uh, the, sorry, the charter people built amazing studios, but it was in Eugene, Oregon. Nobody ever showed up. There was no need for that. Uh, in Atlanta, uh, Tyler Perry bought an, a, a military base, but he built seven big, giant, beautiful film uh, things. So Chris, you don't need big, giant film. That's not your core business, but you could access that. And Avid, 15 years ago, found an office park that did exactly what you're discussing and fibered all of the buildings together so that they were well, and, and, and again, and, and now you, you connect them all, all over the world. There and, we go. And, and that's the where... ability to bring any person or any location into that 
you know, into the conversation. And have know, so access that, and, to the tool or the people then, that know how to drive it. And then be able to bring in any person that has a question or, or that wants to show something. So it's, it's being able to build something that is a web of content as opposed to just a single Well, I guess I want you out. to blow up the word studio because I think we're locked into brick and mortar. And I'm thinking well, what we're you're talking saying about, is a, go ahead. You know, we are talking about brick and mortar at this moment because <laughs> there is, while we can do it in the cloud and we can do all those things, you still need somewhere where there's cameras. And you still need somewhere where there's interaction. And the, the thing is, is that saying we can just build it up somewhere um, gets away from the fact that it's really expensive to do that. Like me loading, like half the trouble that we have is loading in all the time, you know? And so like once we get a studio, we get out of loading in, you know, and now you just turn the lights on and start going. And that's, that oh, makes a dream. huge difference. <laughs> my dream. Um, Ken, uh, Ken and then Stuart, then Mickey, then Jan. Uh, relatively fast and we're going to get yeah. into questions. Now yeah. we, we so, when you, when you, so when you're talking about... Um, IP control because I understand it with because like when you shaded my black magic camera um uh through the ATEM. So that means like if for example, I know I keep going on about my aperture lights, but the 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 CIDUS app runs on my M1. So that means that you'll be able to remote control the light. So anything that can basically the app runs on my M1. So my slider, all of those I can control from that. That means I can then remotely control them from anywhere. And that's what you that's, want to get to is so that you can also to, have, yeah. I mean, when you really think about it, you want to be able to have a studio that is broadcasting out, might have other studios that are connected to it, might have the pro production staff maybe coming in from anywhere to control that studio. The audience is anywhere in the world as well and possibly by themselves or in groups. Some of the production may be in AWS that is all being done and fed back into the overall program or these studios are feeding into that AWS instance. So each studio has its own thing. They're all interconnected, but the end result goes out into AWS, which may be connecting. That may be the big show where all the other pieces are being added. Um, so, so there's a lot of different ways, but we want to think about how all those studios, building the studios around IP control, building them around um, the ability for anybody to run the studio. And we're going to be experimenting a lot with that with all of you as we go into the cooking challenges, as we go into some of the second hours in the in the near future, where I'm going to give people the opportunity to cut the show from their home, you know, without having to to be in our office. Those are the things that, and eventually you move that into the cloud, but there are latency issues in the cloud that make some of that interaction to be less efficient. Um, uh, Stuart and then, and then Mickey. All right, let's, uh, I've got a point. Uh, firstly, um, I'll come back to my point quickly, but Sky mentioned, uh, office complexes and the like. Real estate in those at the moment, with all the businesses closing down, they'll be looking for tenants. So there's probably bargains to be had for that worldwide. But thinking of budgets and what have you, it's and it sounds like the basics we need to cover is a wall that's green, a wall a that's neutral color, a, a floor that we've so just... polished for cameras to move over, and uh, a yeah, high-speed yeah. broadband connection in so, both directions. And that gets us, regardless of budget, that so gets a bunch us of, the basics. You almost never want to use green screen. <laughs> I'm just going to let you know, like, you can use it. Uh, green screen is a, it is, it is a briar patch that you go into that you think, and I'm speaking to someone who's shot thousands of hours of green screen, that the, what it does is it really forces you into a, into a limited place limited tool set really fast. What you really want to think about is modular sets. So things that you can bring details of physical sets in and out relatively easily. Um, that's where things start to become much more interesting is being able to change the set, not being dedicated to a set that is going to look old eventually or have no set or a green screen set. And, and I think green screen sets can get there, but even the ones that they show off as they're the best that they could possibly do in IBC and, and, uh, IBC and NAB are sets and interactions that I would never put in front of a client. <laughs> and they're really proud of them. And they're like, look at us. And I'm like, I would never do that because I can see the edges. I can see the problems. I can see the sizzling on the, on the, across the geometry. I can see all those things that make it not look real and make it not look important. Uh, Mickey and then Jan and then Jeff. Yeah. Just going back to what. And I apologize. You will have to keep your hands up as we, as, when we get a lot of people, cause I won't be able to keep track of what's going on. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, with what the Chris Fritchie was asking earlier, if this discussion is uh, relevant to him and what he does, I think this is relevant to uh, to 
every company uh, coming into a virtual uh, convention with ten, tens of thousands of, uh, of guests to a small mom and pop shop with maybe, you know, 40, 50 employees and the CEO oh. wants to do a little town hall. I think there will be a, a slew of, and I'm starting to see this already, a slew of little essentially insert studios where like a CEO can just walk in, do his speech in front of the, in front of the employees, like over Zoom and walk out. Well, and, and it also goes down to, we're all building, if you look at the Raspberry Pi and the cooking and the stuff that we're doing, we're all building little studios in our house. So when we talk about this, we're getting to a point where, you know, it's, it's all the way down to the individual being able to build a live studio in which they can train people in which they can engage. So it's, it's all the way down to a, a, an individual with, with a couple cameras um, and, a, and a switcher all the way up to, um, you know, huge sound stages. Uh, go ahead, Jan. Um, the ultimate example of what you're describing right now, it, uh, I have been to, it's called Jazz at Lincoln Center. Now, Lincoln Center in New York is huge, and one part of it, completely separated from the rest, is called Jazz at Lincoln Center, and you can Google this, and what they have is multiple stages. They have a place where you can put in an audience. They have actually a theater. They have multiple recording studios. They have rehearsal rooms. They have... Um, audio recording studios for podcasts and they have presentation presenting application rooms where they could do broadcasts for television and it's all interwined with fiber and all connected and now that they and this they did before COVID I was there it's a very impressive right. and um, David Gibson who is the um, who is the production manager of this I've talked I talked to him yesterday and I mentioned that we were going to do something like that. Unfortunately, his schedule wasn't cool. Well, but if you want to Google it, yeah. they were they were way ahead of their time. Well, and, uh, the, the, and when COVID came along, they just moved their whole thing into digital. And you could go to their website and look at and, it. And one of the challenges, and I and I don't know about that one or not, but one of the challenges of all those studios that have got ahead of their time is that a lot of them are sitting on 1080 1080i um, solutions. Um, you know, so that's what we run into a lot is 1080i solutions, which to us are worthless, like literally worthless. Like that's one of the reasons that I go into NEP and I just immediately build up our thing. We won't build a system less than 4K. Like we won't, like we might not go out 4K, but but we are, you know, when we, you know, when we think about building studios for the future, they are 4K and above, you know, because uh, for broadcast, for old old media, it'll be 1080i probably for the next decade because they're in a shrink, a sinking ship and their and their island keep their, the ship keeps on getting smaller and they don't have the money to put into a 4K uh, execution. So so we're not going to see broadcast change anything anytime soon. But if you're building a studio, when we talk about the future of studios, we're talking about 4K as is, um, is 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 the table stakes for building this stuff out. If they're anything less than that, they're they're not building for the future. Um, you know, for now, little ones like these little extremes are fine because these are our home our home devices. And for smaller activations, it's fine. But when you look at anything as a major activation, I mean, I haven't bought 1080p except for these extremes and these little cameras. I haven't bought anything less than 4K for five or six years. Uh, go ahead, Jeff, and then uh, Jim. Right. I want to address something Stuart asked about the space. And I think space is definitely one of those things. It's probably the the bigger part is like, how big do you make it? Uh, the, the studio that we're working on now is 20 foot by 20 foot. And he's, he's convinced that will handle 99% of his events that he needs. Because it's like one, two, maybe three people. And Mickey was shaking his head, but we got to remember what we're talking about. If we're talking about one person, they literally, and they don't move. That's the key. If they don't move, uh, most speakers don't. It's it's a smaller space. It's only nine foot. It's an upper story of, of his existing space that he was able to take over. But the big part of it is we're looking at, we're putting XR in. And that is the part that, that everybody should be watching. I, I did a demo with uh, Disguise yesterday. And where the they're headed... Walls. LED walls, you can do it with projection and we're, we're, we're way in that it's, it's not looking really so good no, right now. So 20 by 20, no Marais problems at, at all. Mm -mm. Not when you're using 1.8. Nope. And it depends on the lens. It does depends on the lens. It depends on the camera, right. but in that space, it is absolutely working. The demo that we did with uh, disguise out of their studio was 10 foot by 10 foot. Now this is in a corner. So 10 foot back and then 10 mm -hmm. foot across and you're shooting into the corner, mm -hmm. the new way they're saying the more 
common way to do it is now with a small slight curve so that the camera is more on axis with the LED as you move around and the camera's kind of, camera's kind of in the middle of the wall. It, it was amazing and theirs was 2.8. So it was a big difference. Now 1.2 is a thing. It's, it's not like mm -hmm. unobtainium either. It's, right. it's expensive, but it's not unobtainium. And when you talk right. about the labor to repaint a wall, the labor to change colors on the wall, the, the expenses in that for small studios, literally, well, we LED had a small wall, studio and do anything. We built it. I, I will say that we, we had a small studio and, and we built it um, as a modular system and we could flip the whole studio in about 90 minutes and it would without any tools. So it's it, it's and the the advantage of it was is that it was it had a it had a real physical feel to it, which we a lot of our clients liked um, uh, Chris and then and then Bill and then Chris uh, uh, Fritchie, then Bill, then Fenwick. I'm good. I'm good. OK, uh, Bill. OK, I, I don't think that this... and pretty quick, Bill, we, we're going to we're going to switch in like 30 okay, seconds. To... I don't think the studio matters as much anymore. You know what matters to me is the brain who's inside no. the studio, who's permanent there. And I still need to shoot him. We had a client, a, a big credit union. They put a million dollars into a studio right before covid. All the latest stuff, black magic, wired up everything. The guy who was the brain behind that took another position. They weren't able to fill it. And it sat there and it hasn't done anything. Well, it's, this it's gets a, back into understands the design who lives there that can really work it like a piano. It's not the piano, it's the piano player. In right. my it's the yeah, it's the, that's why you build everything on IP and remote control. Because what you want is a handful of people. Like so when we need to really rewire something in our office right now, we're, we were incorporating the 806. I got Brian and Tucker working on it. Look, I, I don't, they did, did I fly them in? No, I didn't fly them in, you know, like, and, 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 and Kevin will come up to speed on it and then he will run it most of the time. And anytime there's a, a, a thing and what you, what by doing an IP driven studio, you get into a position where you have core experts that you bring in when you need them, they can do anything in the studio from the cameras to the switchers to whatever and set them all up without being there and then you have operators and local uh staff that execute it but that has been a you're right that the critical problem we've had with studios for a decade is that you you're absolutely right that it has been and this is why i'm so like we will not put stuff in that we can't get to is to your point we need high level staff not to handle the day-to-day -day problems but to handle the emergencies and so by creating a, a ip driven system that you can run remotely uh you are able to um manage that that uh problem much more effectively jim i skipped you so go ahead jim and then chris and then we'll go to questions sure i was just going to mention on the uh the latency topic for site to site uh, vpn on amazon there's a service uh, uh vpn acceleration that you can leverage and then for simplifying routing uh, between site to site, you can use the uh, transit gateway that allows you to bring in sites really rapidly and additional sites without having to touch each additional or each site to uh, make uh, changes for routing. So, for some of the designs that we built, we've used MPLS, you know, which is really the you know that's going to connect MPLS between studios is yeah. how you really start making a real a real solution. Right. Yeah, Chris. I was just going to say tools are fun. I'm not against tools. I use, I'm just telling you, tools are great, but magnets, rare earth magnets are amazing. Uh, you just, you just pop the, pop the wall off. You just pop tools the wall off. Um, anyway, I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh, anyway, go ahead, uh, Chris. Yeah, I was looking yesterday on B&H and they, they sell this uh, big cheese plate that's got four magnets on it. It goes on the hood of your car and they want like $500 for it. So I looked the magnets up on McMaster car. I can build the whole thing for like 120 bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, next, oh, we're going to jump into the questions, Bill. Okay. Uh, Todd Reynolds, North Adams, Massachusetts. I use an iPad as a telestrator. I'm interested in all the options, especially for use with ATEM devices. Um, so this is, the, the advantage of this is that I can see it. So the, you can definitely use an iPad. You can use a Keynote and just, put, you know, run blank screens. All this is is any white art pad that you have, you know, whether it's Procreate or whatever, make it all white have a black pen and then you basically have it full screen and you, I, this is an app that, that I built, but, but it, it just doesn't have any interface. That's the only thing that really sets it apart. Um, and, um, so it goes in as a, as a, you basically, we talked about this a little bit more. I'll do this really fast. There's an earlier one where I talk a lot about it, but I have the Wacom tablet. I have um, a mini, I have the, uh, um, 
I have the ATEM. The mini HDMI goes in as four, channel four for me. The program out of the ATEM goes into the Wacom tablet so I can see what's going on. The that's what the that's what I use the Wacom's HDMI to get. And then the USB goes into the mini to drive it. And that's that's how this all that circular connection is the trick to making um, a telestrator work in um, uh, with with the Cintiq and, and the new one I have around here somewhere. The 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 Wacom one I think is like four hundred and some dollars. And other people are testing cheaper ones that are a little bit less. But I'll tell you, at four hundred dollars, at at eight hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, the Cintiq's too much for most things. At four hundred dollars versus three hundred dollars, I would just get the Wacom because it's a better it's a, it's a better uh, piece. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Real quick. The one you're talking about, that's the one that actually you, you it's a screen and you draw on it. Or is it the yeah, black is it. oh okay, perfect. Yeah. So this is this is the the eight the Wacom one. And it's and that's what I'm moving to. Um the Cintiq that I'm using right now is the one that I've had for a long time. So so it's and it's got a problem that the connector goes out in a weird place and other things like that. Um next question. Rupert McCray of Dallas, Texas says, Will the studios of the future require a new breed of multi talented IT staff? Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. Or or people or people who already work in it that have enough spongy brain left that they're willing to learn new things and they're willing to like Marty Brennis, who's on here every once in a while, is uh he I don't know, I don't know, he's in his sixties, I think. Um, you know, uh and he's been at ILM. I mean, he worked I think he came in during Empire, you know, so he was at ILM in the early eighties. And he is learning every single day. Like he is like just absorbing everything that goes around him, and then he and then he picks it all up. Right now, he's building this giant twenty one ten. This this is someone who you know is uh, again not uh, coming out of college, not new or anything else like that, and he is still learning everything around him all the time, staying current. And now he's building this massive for a big giant company that we all know massive 2110 network to handle hdr and to move things between studios and, and everything else um and and he's, he's able to do that because he's just constantly learning so it, it doesn't it's not a matter of people who are in the industry it's people in the industry that say this is the only way to do this or this is the way we've always done it those people are toast but but folks that are continuing to learn are going to continue to be able to um and, and that's why this is here because we are all committed to learning go ahead roscoe yeah the dante training do that if you're not if you don't come from a traditional bat networking background but you come from a production background do the free dante training it's wonderful to just teach you the basics of networking for the purposes of media production yeah absolutely next question Ant Pruitt of San Francisco. This really sounds like an IT project more than anything, in my opinion. Is that wrong? All the great gear is awesome to have, but it seems like you need priority to have an infrastructure pro on site to connect the dots. Once you get it connected, generally no. <laughs> you know, you don't. You you go back to creativity, but you do have to. Again, in in a lot of ways, what we find is the is that when we uh, when we get this all working, the creatives can actually be more creative because you can bring people into the studio that are just creative. The tech folks can come in anytime they want from anywhere in the world and fix the problems that the creatives are having. So you're actually not, you don't have to have that tech person at every studio. Um, you have that tech person in Savannah, Georgia, or in the Philippines, or in wherever that is that can log in from Oklahoma and fix the problem. Um, and so the creatives can just be creative and, and to be thinking about it. I mean, all of these things are what we're talking about is trying to design them. In fact, the, the analog to digital interface is the whole, like all I work on when I'm building studios is how do I make the analog to digital um, interaction as fluid as possible? How do I make that as seamless and as painless? And just like, that's what, that's what I'm constantly trying to find ways to do is to make that so that when I reach out, I can grab something. When I when I want to draw on something, I can draw on it. When I want to, you know, cut to another angle, I can do that. You know, without having to think about all the tech that was going to be required to make that work to remove all the commas of the production. And so it does take some. Someone has to build these, and I think there's a huge market for um, folks to uh, build these studios for folks. I mean, you know, like to build the next generation um, studios is. Interesting. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, just to, to alleviate um, Aunt Pruitt's fears, I've converted my old photographic studio into being what, you know, this kind of the studio of the future. The IT part of it, I learned from being on office hours and I had to connect it all up. I'm still learning, 
but it's uh, it's not that difficult to have a setup fully automated um, like this. Um, you don't need to be an IT professional to to do it. And every time Ant asks a question, I have to say, you should come on, Ant. It'll be good to have you. All right, all right, next question. Uh, Roscoe Jones here on the panel says, uh, the hard what hardware interfaces, audio mixer, video switcher, are necessary in both a hardware-based studio and an AWS-based system? Are the manufacturers putting dual capabilities into products, or is it a third-party opportunity? I mean, for hardware, we use a lot of Blackmagic stuff, and then we use either Yamaha or, or Behringer stuff because their, their IP stuff is really good. And mostly for Blackmagic, it's because of the API. So we can, there's, it's really written to be supported a lot of different things. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Being in both of those situations, um, are they putting dual capabilities? No, it, they're, yeah. everybody is planning on IP some way, somehow, if they're not building a product that is using IP to be controlling that product, it's a dead product. It, yeah. people are just passing it by. Yeah, without it, yeah, absolutely. I know I am. And this gets into like why we stopped using analog mixers was because that we couldn't control them remotely. We would, re you know, in many versions of this, uh, when we used to do a lot of Salesforce stuff, we would have, you know, Brian would be in the main control and we'd have rooms, you know, that we'd have pro oftentimes like eight rooms where we're managing streaming. The Brian could log into every mixer in every room. So when we were at streaming, we didn't have to call and argue with the engineer in the room, we would just move the slider and tell him, I just need you to don't, don't change anything. We're changing something for you. Um, and, uh, and so that was, you know, that, that was an introduction to that. And that was five years ago, six years ago, Roscoe. So am I looking at protocols from black magic or am I looking at third party protocols? Who's, who's setting up this communication so that I can buy, do I, do I have to buy into an infrastructure? No, so, it just needs to be IP controllable just in general, because once it's on, on the network, anything can talk to it at that point. And, and so like, for instance, with the black magic in its most base state, I can open up if I'm on a VPN into the office, which I am, I can actually open a switcher in the office and do all the work that I want to do in the office just through the app that app that black magic provides. So there's no other than building the VPN connection, which is something that's important. And well, yeah, process. I can, I can control the app, but, but at some point in time, I like to have fingers on buttons. And if right, I'm and talking you, about a live show, I got to have fingers on and, buttons. So I'm not looking at an app. I'm looking no, at but the I'm actual saying hardware I touch. The, the panel doesn't care where you are. If you're on a VPN, this is why VPNs are so important is because I can have a, my laptop connect to it. But if I want the panel, the black magic panel, I can have a four me panel at my house. I right. can connect it to, uh, I, all it needs to know is what is the IP. And as long as it's on the same network as that, as that switcher, it's off to the races and you can totally, and we have totally done that where we've cut shows, look, watching it through zoom, <laughs> you know, like literal well, hangouts at the time, but watching it through hangouts, we can cut a whole show remotely, um, with hardware and everything else right now. And, and there's not any other than the VPN, there's nothing special, you know, of, of having that, that connection for a lot of those things. Brian has moved. I don't know if he, I think someone mentioned the branding of it, but Brian has it set up where he moves sliders in Let's Savannah, Georgia. One. And he, and he is, uh, moving the sliders on our QL1 in our office while he's watching it. It is seamless. Remotely possible is the totally. product. Uh, remotely oh. possible is the mm -hmm. product. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Mickey? And yeah, I think on the, on the audio side of things, I think it may be a bit more advanced in terms of the more open specs for... Uh, for uh, control controllers, um, you know, you have you have MIDI, you have OSC. Although OSC could also be used for other things, um, I think uh, this is what I was mentioning earlier that uh, manufacturers need to uh, have these uh, these control protocols built in already. So, without us having to look at other other um, other manufacturer solutions for for us to be able to control things remotely. And one of the things that we're like, we're about to dive into is using to, to, you know, so audio is pretty well done. Video is pretty well figured out. The thing that we're looking at for, for instance, our remote kits, which I think is also part of the new, the next generation of virtual studio is the ability to bring remotes in easily. And that means building kits for those. And one of the things that we're looking at is Streamweaver from Liminal that makes, they also make Zoom OSC so that we can tie all the lights in. So we can start, you know, we're going to start, our bigger kits are all going to start going out with these, um, we're basically you know, to do DMX to the to the lights through liminal 
Um, you know, and and I think that that is going to be a next generation, uh, you know, piece of of what we're doing to tie it back into the studio experience. Um, next question. Moving on with Rupert McRae of Dallas, Texas, who asks, when picking a location for a new studio, should being within range of a same-day Amazon warehouse be a consideration? <laughs> Generally, again, you should build your studio to 40 to 60% capacity, max, 60% maximum, 40 should be the target, so that you have a lot of ability to adjust with what clients want. Um, you should always be looking at, you should always be budgeting for things to be upgraded, uh, and you definitely want things a storage room is not an optional thing for it you know where you have lots of extra little bits and bobs and and other things that you can use to convert things and so hopefully you're not doing too many same day to to amazon uh, for those things go ahead chris i'll say i've worked out of a lot of studios in my career at a lot of different levels and one of the main things that is overlooked more often than not is all the parts that you don't shoot like I, I would say if I had a if I had a 30 by 30 studio, I want a 30 by 30 workshop slash storage room. Like I would double the size of your studio space for support space, S storing sets, storing tables, storing chairs, uh, you know, a, a, a nominal workshop thing. You're going to break things. You're going to have to build something. I got to tell it's you, having a shop is magical. Like we have really a shop. Is. We have a shop across the parking lot. And uh uh, it's a big one, <laughs> so it's it's uh, and uh, Chris has been there. It's it's a, it's a good shop, and and uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, having the ability, I'm not jealous. <laughs> uh, having a of the ability to uh, create things on the fly is super valuable, um, and so uh, I you know there was a I'm, I'm gonna I'll make this really quick because I think I mentioned it before, but there was. Uh, a company that that we ran into at one of the conventions that we did that that had a, a full size truck that's double expando that had an entire shop in it CNC mills 3D printers everything and it was and it was the most amazing thing in the world and I was talking to the guys there was an, they were all went to Tufts University that one was an architect one was an electrical engineer one was a mechanical engineer and they hated they got they saw each other at ten year reunion they hated their jobs and they're like well let's go do something fun and so all they did is they would come in and their entire job was not to build the things for the convention. It was to fix the things through them because everything gets loaded in and there's that one little thing. And I really, and the client says, it would be really good if we had a little light that would did this little thing. And if you have an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, and architect, you can do anything. And, and so they would, and, and, and a full blown out shop and they would just fix all these little things to not, not to execute the event, but to make it great. And, and having the, having people with abilities with printers and CNC and some wood wood uh, abilities and and all those things somewhere nearby your studio is the way that you build all these little things that like for instance the studios we built for Google um, we machined the controls into the ATEM so it was a Arduino controller it's actually using software from um, Scarhoy this is back in the very early Scarhoy days and we had we actually had it machined so it had a picture of the computer when you want to go to the computer push the button you know, when you want to go to you and there's a little picture of a person push you, you know, and, and so making those things super, again, that's improving the analog to digital interface, which is everything about studios in my opinion. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah. For just going back to Rupert's question of, you know, being within, you know, same day delivery of Amazon where I'm from, it's a one to three week delivery from Gotham sound from Sweetwater. Yeah. So we, we always have like a we keep a, a, a essentially a wish list that you know um, if we need the if uh, if we need the what do you call this if we get funds for something and we need it we have a list already of things that we need to buy and just order immediately and uh, like if we have emergency uh, situations where we need something right away we just have uh, relationships with other other suppliers in in our in this country and also in Singapore because. We can easily fly to Singapore and be back in a couple couple hours and have gear mm -hmm. on hand. Right. No, absolutely. And the first couple of weeks of a studio, you do need that. And then after that, if you've planned well and invested well in, in redundancy and in extras, uh, you will it'll go down to little things that you might need. Batteries, um, it, it, unless you haven't planned well. <laughs> Next question. 
Moving on, Chris uh, Roysden of Round Rock, I believe that's in Texas, not sure. For studios in the future, should we look at repositionable cameras requiring operators in the room or fixed location remote controllable pan tilt zoom cameras? Uh, Go ahead, Jeff. You know my answer is going to be robotics, robotics, robotics. Um, it, it, whether whether it's just simple PTZs or real robotics with a track or even further than that, which uh, Mark Roberts just recently released in a sub $100,000 robotic arm, um, that that's the future for sure. But that said, after watching this demo and working with this demo with Disguise yesterday, it got me thinking more because the camera movement in an XR is not specific to the camera moving. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So you can make some really massive moves in, moves in this extended reality space before you get down to that lens of where it's at. And that is game changing because then you really don't need, you never need operators anymore with PTZs, but you really don't need even a moving PTZ at that point, if that person is just going to stand in that space. There's there's some places that I think that operators become useful, some sports um, as well as uh, some sports, at least at some no, we're, we're handful talking, of them. But we're talking studio. We're right, talking in studio, studio, not sports. Well, and, and, and concerts are another thing. If you're going to put them into a concert, there's organic things back and forth. But to your point, for most things, you're probably absolutely correct. Go ahead, Bill. Um, I was watching over the weekend a uh, YouTube video about Peggy McCreary, who's one of the engineers at Sunset Sound that did Princes When Doves Cry and the rest of that. And I was, I, they were panning around the studio facility. I was realizing mm-hmm. this is a little gem there. I wonder, though, I, it caused me to stop and think, real estate, uh, if, you, if you're remoting in and, and performers can remote in, um, is the head count that a, vis- a business like that in prime real estate that's easily accessible, that has all these links, is it supportable if you're not doing a lot of work, if you don't have that client? Because they were talking about he would come in for months at a time and just buy out the studio. And, you know, one or two clients could survive through that. We are in an area where people do a lot of their work at home and come to the studio only occasionally. And I'm just wondering, as we roboticize this whole process, are we going to get to the point where it's hard to sustain this facility with this kind of workforce? Well, I think that the the issue is is that you, as you make it easier and as you make it and as it becomes more global and as we move to digital events, there's a lot more demand to do it. And these companies don't want to spend a quarter million dollars to build the studio into their, you know, there'll be lots of companies. If you look at like 2000M in Washington, D.C. is three blocks from 30 communication agencies. <laughs> and like, you know, like, and so, so the, the, you know, and the ability for people to walk over and, and, and deal with something and handle it, the, the first step will be tons of these studios that are relatively inexpensive to run because they're global and there's a high demand for these digital as digital first events take off the studio the demand for these studios is going to be really high and the capex required to make them great is going to be very low and i think you get to a point where these studios are running 24 7 because it's a global market so you can have studios that are running every every hour like literally people are just buying four hour blocks and there's six of them and you can buy them and they book them all the time. And I know some studios in DC that just run, they run 18 hours a day. You know, like it's just there, you know, because they're convenient and because the background is is relatively fluid and they can make it look at whatever the client needs. And what happens is you just end up with a bunch of clients that want weekly addresses or weekly shows. It's not enough for them to do it. They don't want to have the headcount. They don't want to have the, the CapEx, you know, to do that, but they're able to pay for, to go into, send somebody to a studio that, that looks good. So there's a, what I was thinking about how many, you know, is this down to a one or two person operation, a very sophisticated, easily all the things and it's one or two humans and they just have to, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely going that direction for our news runs every morning with two people. Yeah. It's, there's a floor director who's just there to clear cables technically. And then there's a person running, all the video inserts, all the all the cuts away, everything, all from that master control running dashboard. Most most That's local news. That's our news station. Most Maybe local news is going that route. Enough space to support a two human operation. Is there is there what a twenty by twenty space? Uh, uh, Jeff mentioned it's easily. Yeah, I, I yeah, I. I I would say 30 by 40. <laughs> well, no, that Based 20 on my by experience 20, with 20 by 25. 18 by 25 that was, the was actual way too small. studio space. I know. So there, no, I there know. is other space I still, know, to I work still, out of. But still, I wouldn't, they, I, wouldn't I, I think smaller, that. if you're looking at smaller events, yes. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. Ne next question. Let's, we're going to have to move quickly. Yeah, Liberty White here in the panel says, uh, what considerations change or do we need to consider when it comes to studios working internationally? What do you mean by that, Liberty? So I was just thinking just it's probably like a checklist and maybe for another show as well. But OK, we've got the VPNs. We've got like what things do we need to think about if we have a host in the studio and a team there and just connecting back and forth. So it's just kind of like a, a dump all, if that makes sense. Uh, language uh, language is a big deal for us when we do it is making sure that and, and I have to admit that it, it's probably arrogant, but we generally require all the teams to be speaking English. Um, just because it's in production, the m most teams have people available, that, at least that we can talk to over comms. They can put people in that can do that. Um, now, if you're doing it regionally, you can get away with a lot of other things. But on an international event, we will tend to to push, we will tend to push English, um, you know, in that process. But there, there's ones that do Francophone, which is French, uh, you know, you know, so they they can do that. But, but that's been what we've done. So comms are really important. Um, same cameras <laughs> you know, really help. It's just really hard. The, the, the color science is different between every set of cameras. And so it's just really hard to have the same feel uh, as you jump from camera to camera. Um, and it's also why we like to have remote control over ATEMs because we can shade the cameras and load things into them to look exactly the way ours look, as opposed to trying to argue with their shader about how we want it. Because oftentimes it's different. The thing to know is that what is considered okay in re certain regions is not okay in our region. So like in Japan, they turn the color and the sharpening really high. Like it's just a cultural way of watching TV. And for an American, it's, it's just brutal. Like, you know, like you can't, you can't watch it. And so, but it's just a cultural change, just difference. Uh, Jeff, and then we'll I, move on. I was thinking a little bit on the simpler side, Alex kind of went more towards the technical side. Uh, besides redundancy of internet, you've, uh, of course, you've got to have that just pretty much in any major studio right now, any implementation. Yep. So two providers equal, uh, not not one really good gigabit connection and then a hundred by hundred that's barely there because you always tap that out, but redundancy in the internet side. And then the second thing is you need either a pulled out couch that's really comfortable or a fold down uh, bed uh, you know, <laughs> like a Murphy or something because you're going to end up sleeping there some nights. Well, and the I'm other thing just is, saying. the other thing you have to think about our distribution, like, so for our, the way our Q&A works, the way Makana works with it, and you guys don't see the teleprompter view or the lower third view or the, or the speaker or the iPad views, but those are all web views that we have on ours so that anyone can open them up anywhere. Like if you want to do put teleprompt, the, our questions on a teleprompter anywhere in the world, you just open up a computer and hit go and it just opens up and it interacts, you know, and so, so those are all things that you we, we do that because we build global events. Um, so you have to think about displays, like how are you displaying all the information as well? Um, you know, to make to make that work. Yeah, it's a good question. Next question. Roscoe Jones here in the panel. Could we teach live directing by giving identical feeds to multiple directors in multiple studios? Or is remote directing dependent on the control of comms and being able to control or finesse the video and audio sources? We have done this. And it is lethally effective. <laughs> so the key is you have a director, so technical direction, people learning how to cut the show. Um, you can have everybody sit there with, give them all the same feeds and have them all start cutting the show. And then you hear a director, ready camera one, go camera one, ready camera three, go camera three, ready camera, you know, and you hear that and everybody follows along to a concert or an event or whatever. And what you get out of that is they learn they learn by following that. You can't have multiple people calling the cameras for obvious reasons, but you can have a person calling cameras with a bunch of people following along. And what they learn is how to follow along. And then they'll slowly, if they have a discussion right afterwards, they can discuss, why did you do that? <laughs> like, you know, and they can, you know, they can uh, observe it. And, 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 and it's, it's one of the most effective ways to train a, a crew. Go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it just seems like a natural that, you know, you allow me to use your feeds to teach with. And yep. I'm just thinking there's all kinds of things that open up here. I, well, we, one of the things we're going to do sometime in the summer, I just haven't, you know, it's been one of, it's been one of the things on the list because we've done it live and it's worked great, is to record all those feeds, get them all in the, get them all time coded and synced and then play them out with the comms from the director. So then anybody could just log in and cut the show. <laughs> you know, like you can just log in and cut the show anytime um, and and learn how to learn what that looks like. And that that is a, um, okay. a fun can way I to- Can I just ask real quick, what were you using to play back the four streams since? 
uh, hyperdeck. Sync. Hyperdecks. Okay. Yeah. Magic. You start telling all to go at the same time. Yeah. They're not perfectly in sync, but they were close enough. Yeah. Next question. Randy Egan of Vancouver, Canada. What VPM software or hardware do you recommend for remote control? I mean, I use Meraki's. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Hardware, Meraki, or uh, Unify, if you're good uh, yep. in making it work with your own network. Uh, behind that, software-wise, uh, Hamachi, my login, mm -hmm. it's got to be one of the simplest software-based and secure um, VPN software-based VPNs that we use. Really happy yep. with that. Been using okay. it for camera control for years. Right, go ahead, Chris. Uh, you know, I'll save it for after show. I have a great story about synced playback. It's it's too long for what time it is. <laughs> okay, right, next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana is up next. I'm working a, towards a studio and a trailer to go digital first broadcast and hybrid for those nonprofits in the digital desert. What can be done for bandwidth? Fiber is non-existent. Cell is spotty to poor. Is Starlink even possible for these needs? And he notes a half mega or less as usual in a lot of the communities he or she services, it's Chris. Jeff. Anytime anybody says cell service is poor, unless you're in the middle of the desert, even then, I mean, I, I, we go coast to coast in doing productions. A live view with six modems in it, it's it's hardly ever offline. Yeah, I, I could literally drive coast to coast. And I don't think I would drop a signal. And the, the, the one thing that we, uh, the one thing we have trouble with with live views, we owned where we leased two of them for a decade is um, if you go to a big, once you get back to where there's a lot of people, you can end up without bandwidth, you know, because they're using up all the cell sites. Um, so we've definitely had that as a challenge uh, when we lean only on live views. And I'm talking about like parades, you know, are, are things that, that can be problematic. Um, KUs are really cheap now <laughs> because of the industry. So, you know, you can get a KU dish, you know, uh, a used KU dish for single digit thousands uh, to put on the top of your truck and um <clears throat> then you're just paying for the the connection to a satellite uh and so the only thing to know there is that that you can get through most things but cloudy days will be something that so a lot of times what we find is a really great combination for remotes is a mixture of cellular and ku um and uh the k c band is the truck's too big uh ka you get cloud you know fog you'll, you'll have a problem um, KU is the one that we've been the most successful with mixed with a cellular as primary and backup um, has been very effective uh, in areas where we have no other choice. And then the last one, by the way, is point to point ubiquity um, antennas where we can you can go 10 miles. So if you get point if you if you can see something with Internet that's 10 miles away, you can get a, a one gig connection to that location. Uh, go ahead, Stuart. Just a note on satellites and Starlink. Uh, geostationary satellites orbit at 36,000 kilometers, so your latency sucks. Uh, Starlink does have a limitation, and that is what they, they're calling the cell area. If you move outside of the area that your aerial is registered for, you won't get service at all. Uh, I'm still looking for details Currently on right how now. big that is, so I can go Currently. from Currently. Melbourne to Phillip Island to Adelaide and stay in a cell, and I'll be happy. Yeah, you'll. I think that for real time communication back and forth, I don't think Starlink's going to work great, but we'll see. Um, but for streaming, I think it could be it could be life changing. You know, to be able to to do that. Um, next question. Ed Horn and Warren, Michigan. Redundancy has been mentioned as a priority. Would you consider a cellular surface service for a backup ISP? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. On the third, only on the third. <laughs> <laughs> we've definitely used it. I mean, within budget, we've definitely used live use as the second, as the backup for it, um, you know, for our main signals. Uh, but, but generally to Jeff's point, uh, generally it's the C and the pace <laughs> contingency. So primary is typically fiber for us, fiber or terrestrial backup is, or alternative is typically uh, satellite. And then, then we go to that as a third one. Next question. Frank Hilgers of Naperville, uh, Illinois. How do you handle network latency for sync and control when you have multiple remote locations? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeff. Send it to the cloud, sync it up there. Everybody's gonna be using the cloud as, as a central location and you can sync up all your audio and video so it matches up there. And you could do it to a site if you were doing co-location or if you actually had a site with enough bandwidth to be able to handle it too but it's about having the right tools in place. 
And and again, the other thing is if you're going to connect those to go back and forth, um, you're going to want to have a really great fiber connection between the two. And again, as you build studios, they're going to sit there for a long time. We're talking about studios, not really a setup for a remote, but a studio studio. You're going to want to look at stuff like LTN, the switch, um, MPLS, those types of things that are really uh, getting bits there less than 50 milliseconds. Like that's the, you know, that's the thing that for studios to those next generation studios will be able to do that in a heartbeat. And they'll be able to go slow down to 250 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds. But they're going to, the, the great studios are all going to sit way under 100. Um, and, and that's going to be, that's not something you can go to the cloud and back. It's going to be something they, they connect directly. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so I appreciate everything you guys are talking about here. And a lot of this comes down to the connectivity of the studio and the cameras and all that stuff. But what advice do you have for people building studios from this day on? where they might have to show their feet or six feet in front of them. I mean, do you like to see a hard line at the back wall meets floor? Should it have a cyclorama? Should it be curved? And what, what advice do you have? I built a set. Like I would build a set for that. Uh, uh, Jeff would do XR. I would build a set. I think that I haven't seen it. I have not seen an XR that I thought was good. And I, you know, NAB and IBC What's so XR? far. Oh, that's like all LED walls behind you. Extended reality is what basically yeah. what the shorthand of it is. So it's VR, virtual reality, and AR, augmented reality, together using both. And the, the better ones are using the back. So you're looking at a background that's LED, a sidewall that's LED, or possibly the newer ones are the curved LED in the foreground, mm -hmm. and then the floor is LED yeah, also. Mandalorian looks great. It's the only version of it that I've seen that, that, I, that I would put behind a show that I worked on. Without well, being forced to. Mere mortals can't afford <laughs> so, three LED walls. In right. So, so again, <laughs> what I would think of is, number one is also think about it really feeling like, like for yours, I would make it feel like a shop. When I wouldn't worry, you know, I would make it a great, you know, I would love to get more space because I love depth of field, you know, like a short depth of field. So I would want a lot of space between them in the back, but have it feel like you're in the warehouse or in the shop, whether that you are or not, um, ha have you feel like you're there and it's just a little bit more, I mean, whether it's authentic or not, it'll feel more authentic. So that that's something to to kind of think about there. Go ahead, Chris. I think one of the best things to do is is to embrace really embrace the theme. Uh, for the last ten years, I worked on Computer Chronicles. We built a set. We used tools uh, that um, <laughs> that was a giant fanciful computer lab that a, allegedly overlooked Silicon Valley. So we had a window. We had a giant photo. It was cool. It, 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 it for a while it was the Oracle buildings. Um, and it was this pretend lab that Stuart worked in and we had racks of old computers that we'd very carefully, you know, uh, set up old stuff. Um, I love Fritchie's lab, you know, yeah. I, th well, I and, say embrace it and, and think and, of Adam Savage. And also think of Twit, Twit, Leo does a great job yeah. with that where he's got a really comfortable set. He's got a bunch of different ways. He can turn that set about three or four different ways. He hasn't been doing that recently, but he can. Uh, create three or four different entire looks, um, you know, inside of that, that, that look pretty cool. And so thinking about different angles that you can use to generate a different feel inside of that set is, is also a great way to approach that. Absolutely. Next question. Chris Widener of Lafayette, Indiana says for a digital first studio, are video wall backgrounds a must then like blue Melnick studio, I believe that's rear projection. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> I think it's, I, I, Worked on a lot of LED walls, you know? And so the question is, is whether you can really make it look realistic, like really realistic. Because if it's even got aliasing on the edges, the audience will subconsciously understand what they're looking at. And and that's the real challenge is that, is, and, and it doesn't feel as authentic. That's why I don't do it, but we'll see how it goes. Good. I could be wrong. Next question. Uh this one's going to be a little interesting. Old studio studios were a central station. Grass Valley Switcher, SSL, Neve Console, Ross Switchers. The Neve? <laughs> Neve, yeah. A Neve at an old studio? Amazing. Automation. Yeah, very um, good. Um, with room for, this, for the clients. Then graphics and so forth ate the client space. Shouldn't things now look more like SpaceX control room? Lots of stations or lots of operators with a separate audio mix room separated. I go ahead, Jeff. Yes and no, except that it's not going to be a huge room with a lots of tables. It'll be one table 
And then you'll have lots of operators sitting at their own tables at their house or yeah. at another studio or something like that. We're not, we're gone. The, the times I like building out a studio with X amount of control room and things like that. I think we're, there are going to be some that still do that just for budgetary reasons. But I think we're way past that now. After after dealing with what we did in COVID and remoting well, and so much of our users and our, our I'm sorry, our operators now, I I will never go back and build a big, huge control room because yeah, we would it doesn't we're, make sense. To, to Jeff's point, we're past putting uh, operators shoulder to shoulder ever again. Um, we don't know how long COVID will last. Like we don't like we get into this thing like, oh, it's doing great. But they're talking about wanting to revaccinate everybody every year, possibly. I mean, this is like the CEO of Moderna, Moderna or whatever that thing is. Um, and and people aren't going to like, you know, like, let's be clear, like people aren't going to go keep going back over and over and over again. It's hard enough to get them to do it the first time. So so you're going to get into this thing where, you know, putting people shoulder to shoulder uh, from a practical perspective just doesn't make sense. Um, this is also why, by the way, hybrid events are going to have trouble if, if that happens, you know, and, and if I was building one right now, I would take into account that I don't know. So like our TD and our, our, our um, audio person, our audio window or office and the TD used to be in ne right next to each other. They could talk back and forth. Now they're in two separate rooms and our engineers in another room. And so even the stuff that we have physical is separated out and, and then to go, to go even further our, uh, you know, we're getting, bringing in more and more staff remotely every day, you know, where they're just, the more and more people are running it from somewhere else. Again, most of our stuff is mixed by Brian. Brian's in Savannah, Georgia. Like he was there, he was in our office for four months, you know, doing events, but that was only because we weren't ready for that quite yet in the system. But uh, there's gonna be more and more people working remotely. Uh, if they're not working remotely in the building, they're working remotely. Now, as that relates to studios, one of the things that's important is to think about how do you make sure that that communication is great? How do you make sure that they see color accurate information? How do they see, you know, stuff at low latency? How do they have the comms? The comms become super important. It's why I invested in the 806 instead of something smaller or something different. The 806 is incredible overkill for, uh, you know, for what we're doing with it right now. But I know that I need to be able to add, you know, 80% more capacity to it. And you know, in our studio, where I mean, the studio that's in the building uh, with 60 by, you know, 60 by 60 foot soundstage um, is by 30 <laughs> is going to have lots of crew in it still moving things around and everything else. But the, ver the, the cutting between them and the audio and everything else is going to become more remote. But that now I have to have lots of spy cams so that they feel like they're there. You know, they feel like they understand the they can get their head around what they're looking at as they're as they're doing that. So. All right. Well, that was fun. All right, go ahead, Bill. I just thought that's an interesting is where we're moving toward a place where somebody will be standing in a server room somewhere going, those three racks, that's Sunset Sound. Those 20 racks, that's Coca-Cola. <laughs> that thing over there, that is, and, and pick your physical location, your business, your identity, your brand. They're well, all going to just live. And again, when we have, when you look at the power of, when we get used to this, right, especially, <laughs> and, and the power of the CEOs being able to come in from their office the next generation, we haven't talked about this, but I mean, as we go into these studios, the next generation of, I mean, I believe the next generation of every CEO and every C-level person is going to be there. All their offices will be built. And I know this for a fact that they're already building them this way is their office. The next generation of these offices are all being built as studios. You know, they're, they're being built with cameras built into them, with lighting built into them, with great audio. That's all remote controllable for the C-suite so that they, can project anytime they want like and, and it just got to a point where they you know they want they don't want to have to have a setup or a thing to do that they just want to pull the cap off and turn the you know flip the switch and they can start talking to everybody and be part of those events and that's how you're going to get more and more of those more and more interactions but you're right bill it's going to be people coming in individually and there'll be times when you want to actually be in there physically i'm not saying that, that won't happen but and these studios are going to be a key piece of that especially when people aren't ready to invest in the hardware go ahead chris are 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 you willing to share which companies are are taking this strategy? Can you? I can't. But I know the people building them. Can I call you this afternoon? <laughs> I can't talk about it. I can't talk about what's it. so so that I mean, there. It would be safe to say that they're the top part of the Fortune 100. <laughs> so so you know anyway so the uh, that 
but that's the next generation is all, you know, is really thinking about broadcast as something that uh, C-suite does all the time, you know, whether it's to their own employees or, or also because people are starting, it's starting to sink into them that people don't take them as seriously when they have echoey audio. I mean, if you look at that, the social network thing that happened in Congress, you know, the congressmen looked like fools, you know, because, you know, Mark and, and, and uh, Sundar and, 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 you know, they, they all, they have teams that do that, right? Like literally, I, they have teams that make them look exactly the way they want to look. And I disagree with a little bit of the decisions on some of them, but they looked infinitely better than all the Congress people who are doing it on their own, hacking away at it, you know, with horrible video and bad ideas for the background and everything else. That, like the thing that, that affected where that whole, com that conversation died, by the way. Did you notice? Like it just, People stop talking about it. You know why? It's because all the Congress people look like idiots. <laughs> like it's so, and I'm not getting into politics, but they all look like idiots. And it was because of their cameras. Like, like literally, it is not because of what they were talking about. A lot, there's a lot of valid points and a lot of things that the cameras and their audio made them look small. And it made them look like it made the folks that they were trying to grill, you know, they they're used to being on the big stand in the in in uh in, you know. They're on the big stand with the big mics and the, and the people are in the little in the, in the little uh, desk down below and they they have power. That is a big piece of moving an idea forward. And they gave that up. So they went through all that trouble and it was a dud and it was because of their cameras and their audio. And, and they had great points that that people thought that they looked silly, you know, and 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 they look silly because the other side played harder than they did. Go ahead, Chris. I I yield. OK, anyway, so that's the so. C-suite is starting to realize that. And so that's why all this money is going into it. And it's, it's, it started last April. I mean, some of these companies bought 5,000 kits, <laughs> you know, like, like they're not, you know, like these aren't like little, uh, investments and some of the companies have been working on it for a long time. So anyway, jump, we'll jump to the post show.